So is this going to be live or is it yeah, it's a going, recording? It's going live right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just wasn't sure if you changed it up from last time. So. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. Our guest today is Ricardo Perez. Ricardo, are you ready to be great today? Always. Ricardo Perez grew up in South Texas, where he raised himself, almost didn't graduate high school, and served as a sniper who could have medically retired from the U.S. Army, but turned it down to say what little sanity he had left. After only discharging him from a historically hard hit unit, Ricardo received degrees in chemical engineering and chemistry, filed a utility patent, and is a graduate of the MS Entrepreneurship Program offered by the Foster School of Business at the University of Washington. Currently, he's a research scientist on the next generation sequencing team at the University of Washington Department of Virology, hopes to be a PhD student by the end of 2022. Ricardo, thanks for being here today. <laughs> thanks for having me, Jason. So this is actually Ricardo's second time on the on the podcast. First time was a great conversation, and we just have so much to get going to. Like, if we wanted to, me, me and Ricardo, Ricardo talk on pre talk, we could actually talk at twenty thousand hours just about different stuff, right? Because we just get along so good. Yeah, definitely. And so we will probably like go to do, do different subjects. First one I talk about is your patent that you was out finally able to like get done, right? Can you talk about your patent and the process for that, the frustrations, and like all you had to go through for that? Yeah, I mean it. Um, it started in 2018 is when I first did the provisional patent. And yeah, you just, you know, it, for me, it took three years from the time I started the provisional patent to the time I got awarded the patent. But that could have been faster based on how much I, you know, how green my pockets were to throw at my patent attorney. So, you know, it was basically like pay as you go, they would give me a cost, it was like a monthly payment thing to get it done. And uh, yeah, so it was just this long process of starting that provisional patent, doing the uh, paying for the initial patent search, because ideally you do a patent search on your own, see what you can find. And then that way you send it to the patent attorney, that way they have a list. Because the way I thought about it was, if I search patents on my own, I can just send them to my patent attorney and I save him that time. He can just look through those patents, determine whether I can patent my idea or not. And he's like, oh, that's cool and all, and I'll look through those. But to look through patents, I think I can't remember what he would charge. I think it was like a hundred dollars per patent for him to look at. So and it's, yeah, he was like, Hey, flat fee, a thousand dollars. I'll look through all, you know, whatever I can find. I'll search the, the, uh, prior art on my, and, myself. And, and how do you find your patent attorney? Is someone recommend it to you? Or you just did a Google search for patent attorneys and found the one you thought would be best for you. Yeah. I did a lot of research on patent attorneys. Uh, it was quite a few months actually, you know, cause it's, for me, especially because I knew based on what I found on my myself online, that it was going to be a fine line that I'd have to walk. Um, you know, based on what I found, I mean, there were patents by LG and Sony and like major companies that were kind of bordering on what I was wanting to do. So, you know, I was like, man, I got to pay, a, you know, I should probably go to a better, you know, I'm not, I shouldn't shortchange myself and pay, you know, for a bottom tier patent attorney for something that's going to be, you know, where I myself found, you know, patents that were similar. So I thought like, man, I just need to go to somebody that's one of the best. I did the research and I actually called two other patent attorneys. I think one was in Florida and one was in Texas. And um, yeah, I just decided like, you know what? I, you know, it was like that self-doubt thing. Like he's one of the best patent attorneys. He's like one of the, he's a patent attorney to some of the sharks on Shark Tank. And so he's like, he's, you know, a, a nationally kind of known, probably even like world known patent attorney. And I, you know, in that self doubt, that's why I called the other patent attorneys at first. I'm like thinking, no, oh, this guy's not going to work with me. You know, he's probably going to be too expensive or whatever. And um, so, yeah, you know, I just, just stabbed the anxiety in the face and I sent him the email and we got things kicked off and ended up being, you know, relatively affordable compared to the other things. And the way he talked about it was when you, with my patent attorney, when you file the provisional patent, all that cost is going to get rolled towards the full utility patent. So he talks about how, you know, basically it's like almost a no loss thing, right? So where he's putting in the work for the provisional patent and if something goes wrong, then you can just kind of kill it there. Cause with the provisional patent, you have one year from the time you file to the time you actually submit, um, you know, something, you know, you kind of give, uh, I think that's how it works. You just kind of give the patent, you know, the patent attorneys send like a notice saying like, Hey, this is what we intend on doing. And within a year or yeah, they filed the provisional patent and within a year of the provisional patent being filed, then they have that year to file the full patent. And so in that year, the entrepreneur has time to, you know, have some protection, some level of protection on their idea, and be able to show it to people. 
and determine whether or not like, Hey, in that year time, should I push it forward or not? So, so what, what's the advantage, what do you, what's the advantage of having a pandemic? Like, what, what do you get from pan? You get extra money. You like, what, I mean, what, what is that? Is, is the time and money you put into a pan actually worth it? Uh, well, it can all depend, you know, for me, I saw it as a win-win because the way I saw it was as an engineering student, a lot of the jobs that I applied to asked the applicant, uh, do you have any patents? Do you have a patent? And it's like, no, next question. And so whenever I was getting, when I wasn't getting any, you know, interview opportunities for jobs or any, you know, anything back, I thought, well, you know what, I have this idea from, you know, being an engineering student and it, I mean, in my mind, I thought I could get it done faster than a master's degree, right? Like it's, it's obviously, you know, it's cheaper than a master's degree, depending on the type of thing you want to patent. But for me, you know, cheaper than a master's degree, I thought I could do it faster than a master's degree. And I was like, hey, cheaper and faster. That way I can get something else on my resume to get me to compete. Because a lot of the jobs are like, hey, bachelor's degree, but master's preferred. So I was like, man, I don't got time to go get a master's degree. I just graduated my bachelor's degree and I got, you know, a bunch of things going on. So can you explain what actually does your patent do? Oh, uh, yeah, it's just um, basically I have the utility patent for convective heat transfer raise it up a little bit yeah, yeah so convective heat transfer so basically it's just a radiator uh phone cases are all plastic right and plastics an insulator so a full plastic case is essentially just baking your phone in an oven so when i was an engineering student i was like man if we can just replace a large portion of this insulating plastic with a metal plate then um then it'll be a radiator and help the phone breathe so that's basically all it is is just replacing the insulating portion of the phone case and replacing it with something that's, you know, and can people buy that now? Um, well, the, there, I have a Navy veteran that's helping me get these made. And uh, man, this has been the biggest struggle for years, you know, basically since I filed the provisional patent three years, I've been trying to get plates made. And uh, I've gone to like minting companies, military coin commemorative companies, jewelers, um, 3d printing companies, like I've done it all and I've gotten different things. And, you know, obviously I need something that's going to be cost effective for the consumer, not make $300 phone cases or something, you know? So, uh, this Navy veteran, I finally, you know, I, out of desperation, I just went to a CNC Facebook group and I was like, Hey guys, I'm trying to get this done. It seems simple enough. Right. I mean, an aluminum plate that's already, you know, like factory, the thickness, right. They don't even got to mill the thickness down. It's literally the thickness of the factory plate. Just need to cut it and etch it up. And, um, so yeah, the Navy veteran was like, Hey, you're a vet. I think I can help you, you know? And so he's been for like six months, six, seven months now trying to help me get it done. And part of that towards the end of last year, uh, was COVID of course, like kind of wrecking his life. He was a federal employee and, you know, he didn't want to get the jab. So he had to leave his job and find a new job. And then his parents got COVID and his grandma ended up in hospitalized, not for COVID reasons. And, you know, like I said, it's been a years long thing and he's a Navy vet with real life issues. So I'm like, I'm not even going to bother him. I was just like once a month, I'd message him and ask him, Hey man, how's your family doing? How's your, you know, how are things going? So, you know, when the new year kicked off and he's like, Hey, people are getting better. And you know, now we're getting some product out, but yeah, I think hopefully in the next month that will uh, open my Shopify site. I do, and, and, I do have and, a Shopify and, 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 site. What, what are you looking at the price point being for them? Um, for like the generic uh, case itself, fifty dollars, fifty fifty five dollars with shipping included. Um, so yeah, around there. I'm trying to keep it, you know, in the price range of OtterBox. And the thing for me that's hard now is I'm buying these cases at full price, so they'll run me anywhere from ten to twenty five dollars alone. And then I take these in my garage and I make the cut myself. Yeah. And then the Navy veteran makes this cut, and you know, okay. we make it work. Okay. Hey, quickly, can you tell a story? I think it's a great story where you were at a friend's house. And he put his phone in the, in the ice box. You're like, oh shit, you do that too? Yeah, man, that was a, that's really what spurred me to, and made me realize that, man, like I'm not the only one that has this problem. And so, and I talked about senior engineering student realized like, man, always sticking my phone up to the AC of the car, throwing it in the freezer. And I throw it in the freezer a lot of times in, you know, two degrees, I'm going for two degrees about to graduate. My wife working full time, two kids that are like two and five, you know? So the world's spinning crazy and my phone gets hot, it would bother me. So I'd throw it in the freezer. And a lot of times I'd just sit there for 20, 30 seconds because it's in the freezer, right? It doesn't need to sit there long. So I just kind of hang out by the freezer. But a lot of times, you know, my attention gets pulled and I walk away. And then 30 minutes later, I'm like, damn, where did I put my phone down? Where, where, where? 
And then I'm like, oh, it's in the freezer. So I'd pull it out and it'd be off and frozen. And like, oh man, I hope it didn't, con- you know, with the hot and the cold, it condenses. So I'm like, man, I hope I didn't create a bunch of moisture on the inside and kill my phone. And so um, one day I went over to my classmate's house uh, to, do, you know, work on some chemistry homework. And um, as soon as I walked in, I sit down, you know, start pulling the stuff out my bag, getting ready to study. And he's going crazy, you know, over all over his, his apartment, like looking for um, his phone. He's worried, where's my phone? Oh, yeah. And then he opens up his freezer and he pulls it out. I'm like, what? And my mind exploded. I was like, what? You do that, too? I thought I was the only person in the world who put their phone in the freezer. So it was just like this really eye opening moment of, man, I'm not the only person who has this problem or cares about this problem. Right. Like there's other people putting their phones in the icebox or putting them where they're trying to cool them down. So you're doing a lot, a lot of stuff. You're doing a lot of great things, but let's change. Let's talk about imposter syndrome, which I think everyone has. And like, I was reading this article earlier today and this blew me away. Like everyone has imposter syndrome. So Suni Lee, she won the gold medals in, in the Summer Olympics for all around gymnastics, right? You know, she's at Auburn now, like great gymnastic. And she was talking about how after she won the gold medal, she had imposter syndrome because of course, uh, Simone, Bo, Simone Biles dropped out because of mental health. Mm. And so soon he was like, like, if she wanna drop out, I wanna have to be the gold medalist. And I'm thinking, man, you won the freaking gold medal. And like in the Olympics, gold all around best gymnast and you have imposter syndrome, like what the fuck's going on, right? Yeah. Can you just have to talk about how that, some, it tends to like destroy some people, right? Even though you're succeeding, doing mm-hmm. stuff great. I know so many people do great things. They're always like, oh, it's luck or, someone else could do it better like no actually you're, you're doing the work you're doing the shit you know but it's like it's it, it, it everyone suffers from it, right yeah it's really um it's you know it's it's a demon we all battle man no matter what we do no matter who we are it's like you said and even if she won the, even if she won the silver medal like even if she would have become runner-up like man that's still, still an incredible sec- second best yeah, award right like, like oh my goodness like to be second place in the world at anything you know like there's only one person better than you. It's not a, it's not a thing to look, to be frowned upon or to feel bad about. And uh, it's funny because I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, artist Daughtry. He's like a rock. Yeah. Area. Yeah. Yeah. I and am. he's like, he always wins second in everything. He wants second. Wasn't like, he on like an like American Idol or voice? Yeah, something, something yeah. like that. And then he came second on the mass Singer. And it's funny because like, and I remember, no, I remember on mass Singer. Yeah. So he's like, he's got a great voice. He's one of the few like modern day artists that I can tolerate listening to. And, um, and it's funny because I was reading through the YouTube comments and somebody was like, hi, the second I knew, like I heard the voice, I knew it was Daughtry and I knew he wasn't going to win because he gets second at everything he does. <laughs> and, but he's like, he's super successful, has his yeah. following. And it's like, who cares if you're second, <laughs> right? Like that's the thing. But with the imposter syndrome, I think we all have it because, or you, you start to feel that way because in our minds, we, we shit on ourselves a lot, you know, like we we're our own worst critic we do yeah and so um that's a big part of it and so like you gave your example and one example that really resonates with me is because i watch a lot of the ufc and fighters and justin gaethje which is he's competed for the championship and he you know when he was working his way up he um he was winning fights winning fights and he's like man like he would freak out after he would win he's like man i'm winning these fights it's like i feel like i'm always gonna go in there and get knocked out i can't believe i'm winning i can't believe i'm gonna be a you know like fight for a championship he's like he's talking about his imposter syndrome. And I'm like, whoa, like I would have never guessed Justin Gaethje, who seems very confident, goes in there and takes people's heads off is has imposter syndrome, you know, and it's like, we, you know, when you get to those, you know, those levels of competing with, you know, world class people, or like I said, you know, just feeling like you're in a spot where maybe you grew up poor, you know, like yeah, yeah, disenfranchised. I, 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 don't, I don't belong here. Yeah, yeah. Things, yeah. I think that's a big part of it. You know, it's like we're all, we're our own worst critic. And a lot of times it's just because of where we originally started and grew up or yeah. came from. And, I think a lot of people had, had those two voices, one saying you can do it, other one saying, no, you can't. And they're always battling each other, you know. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, sometimes the voice says, what the fuck are you doing here? Wins out, unfortunately. Yeah, it's funny because I was telling my wife about that the other day, man, because I just think about it a lot. And for me, I'm pretty good about keeping outside voices out, like not caring about what other people think about me. And, um, and it's funny because I beat myself up enough and I'm like, man, I'm thankful that I don't care about what anybody else thinks. Cause I, I beat myself <laughs> up enough. Like if I cared about what other people else think, like, man, I'd be destroyed all the time. And so it was funny. Cause then the next day I saw like something on social media, that was like a quote similar like that. Like, Hey, don't beat yourself up because people do it for you. You know, like it's kind of one of those things you just got to deal with. Yeah. We all got to learn how to deal with it. So next, talk about growing up in Freer, Texas. Yeah, it's just a small town, Freer America is how they like to 
for your Texas America. We, um, yeah, it's just uh, like 2,500, 2,000 people. One of the, I think we might be the biggest little town in the county. Yeah, I think we are. So yeah, the county, you know, it's got three small towns. And this is like a South Texas, right? Yeah. Down past, um, what's it called, name town, Brownsville, the area or Corpus Christi? Or... Yeah, it's a, a little bit west of Corpus Christi. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Brownsville, it's north of Brownsville, okay. but they're, you know, relatively the same distance, uh, depending, you know, depends if you want to go east or south. But, but yeah, it's a small town, um, you know, tight knit community. And it, it was just, you know, I grew up on a 120 acre ranch. So, you know, I just grew up. Mostly the only time I didn't live on the ranch was in junior high for three years for all of my grade school. So all of elementary ranch, junior high in town and then high school and back at the ranch. And yeah, it was interesting growing up out there because, you know, you really have nothing to do out there, you know, to, other than whenever I was in high school already and we had direct TV and dish, you know, like satellite TV. But yeah, in elementary school, it was like going to the antenna and, you know, three channels, mostly static. So I mostly played video games, just went around the ranch shooting my one pump or 22 or something. It's okay. What kind of ranch was this? Like actual cattle ranch or? Um, no, we never had any uh, cattle on it, but we did, you know, there were, wi there was wildlife, you know, we had a rabbit and now there's deer there. It was kind of, it's kind of weird because I feel like deer at this pace point in texas is like an invasive species because yeah. growing up i didn't have any deer on my ranch and now i have deer on my ranch and when i was just there in december you know i'm driving early in the morning with my dad to go you know do the gun show and in, in there and promote my book and phone case and stuff and we were driving early in the morning and there i mean dozens and dozens and dozens of deer just like on the sides of the road from just driving you know and just running back and forth running back and forth and i'm like dang these things are like getting to the point where they're just breeding them out of control. Cause obviously, you know, these ranchers have been breeding them selectively for their antlers for a long time. And now it just feels like it's getting to a point where they're becoming more of an invasive species than anything. Yeah. And then talk about how um, you got involved with the plants. Yeah. You know, I growing up on the ranch, everyone could tell me about animals and, you know, cottontail rabbit, Bob white quail, and you know, the javelinas or colored peccary and all these different animals but no one could tell me about plants other than like mesquite trees or, you know, like the very few, you know, common or like the prickly pear cactus, you know, like the very common plants. Um, but I was always wondering like, this is grass, but what kind of grass? And these are trees, but what kind of trees? And these are, you know, brush, but what kind of brush? And then uh, in high school, there's a, there's a competition in, in Texas and it's everywhere in a lot of states. It's uh, FFA, Future Farmers of America. And um uh, yeah, so in ag, our agriculture classes, there's a, a ag competition, an FFA competition called plant identification. And so on Fridays, our my teacher would drive us around town showing us the plants. And he'd take us to a convenience store first for a few minutes to grab some snacks, and he'd, he'd drive us around town showing us the plants. And, and this guy, he actually became like one of your big mentors, right? Yeah, he is the reason I graduated high school because my freshman year, I didn't, wasn't able to take these classes. So my freshman year, I was skipping school, failing classes. And uh, I tried to play baseball my freshman year, but I failed out because, you know, like I said, I just was doing what I wanted and skipping school. And then uh, my sophomore year, I was basically on that same track. And but I took this class. And on Fridays, like I said, he would take us to ID the plants. And I would just like be attached to his hip because I wanted to learn everything I could. It was like, literally, I've been waiting my whole life for this, you know, and now he was teaching it to us. So I'd be attached at the hip to him, trying to soak it up, trying to, in it, you know, within a month, he realized like, yo, his kid's for real about it. And um, he told me about the competition. He's like, it's the hardest competition. You know, nobody likes to do it because it's so hard. You got to be able to identify hundreds of plants at any stage of growth. And I'm um, like, I don't care, you know, sign me up. I want to learn. And yeah, so it was just me and then two other seniors. So me as a sophomore and two other seniors and one was his son and the other was his son's best friend. So, you know, they had been basically growing up around it and learned their whole life about the plants and they knew so much and that's what really motivated me it was like man they knew so much about the plants and um i was like man i would just want to like keep learning so did, I, did you have a, some kind of system to help you memorize stuff um no oh, well i mean in a sense based on the plants themselves and the um what's the word the physical traits of the plants like sedges the sedges the the stem of the sedge was a triangle so sedges had edges right so so there was these little things to help us kind of remember and memorize the, the plants. And can you still like, you know, identify like every plant there is pretty much? Um, I 
you know, these are just Texas range plants. Mm -hmm. So that was a, you know, disappointing thing about the competition was we went to the state competition and we won. And normally when you win state comp state competitions, you go to the national level and compete for the national competition. But the year we won state was the year that they stopped doing national competition for plant ID mm -hmm. because it's too hard to get students from all across the U S to study one set of plants and make it fair for everybody. So they ended up dropping it, but I mean, I can still identify a fair amount of plants. You know, I can probably, you know, identify a couple dozen okay. as opposed to hundreds whenever I was in grade school. But yeah, it's been a while. Next, can you talk about what you, what you and your wife are doing with the Snohomish County um, Chamber of Commerce? Yeah, um, that has been quite the grind because it took forever to get the tax exempt status. And um you know, not long after she started it, she ended up getting hired on by a chamber of commerce and they did talk to her about kind of merging them both and, and things like that. So those were things that, you know, are still kind of up in the air, but for the meantime, you know, it's kind of been with one of those things where life, you know, is throwing us all kinds of ways. And like we were talking about earlier, me potentially moving back down. So that kind of. And, and one thing I didn't know, chamber of commerce are actually nonprofits, right? Yeah. I think I told you the last time I just thought they were like underneath the Department of Commerce, like government agencies. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't know you just someone could just randomly open one up, right? I had no clue. Yeah, it's um, it's weird how um, there's all kinds of these different designations that nonprofits fall under, and uh, Chamber of Commerce, and you know I think it's weird how you know a lot of like businesses, like the the Better Business Bureau is a nonprofit. So it's kind of weird to think that these, you know, nonprofit organizations are, you know, seem like businesses to yeah, a lot of people, and, unless and, like and you dig. Yeah, it's probably have so much influence on business and different things you do, right? Yeah, and it's like, probably, don't quote me on this, but I think the NRA is probably a, a nonprofit. I've heard, I've heard that before, yeah, too. I'm, yeah. pretty, I'm pretty sure the NRA is a nonprofit, too, so. Yeah, a lot of weird kind of, you know, IRS codes and lots, like, they have lots of different designations for the way businesses can fall under and yeah. things they can do. Next, are you still doing stuff with Omex Analytics? Yeah. With, is, is that, that's the snake venom toxin. Yeah, thing. yeah. So with that, I actually talked to my co-founder about this recently. You know, I've been so busy with this, the phone case stuff in my book and getting these actually out and available to the public over the last year or so um, that, that, you know, the Omex stuff, because Really, at our stage, we're working on still getting patient data that, you know, like, um, yeah, you know, basically patients who have been snake bitten and, and you know, get their, their blood work and their data from, you know, their um, hospital visits. And that's been a grind, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. We actually reached out to the uh, poison control. Poison control is actually one of the bigger you know, anti-venom, like if you get bit by a snake, you should contract, contact poison control, which is kind of weird. Like if you call 911, they're going to call poison control to see where the nearest snake venom is and which hospitals have it. So yeah, it's kind of been this weird, like learning process, but we all understand that, especially for a, a, a tech startup, what we're trying to do, it's going to take, you know, years of kicking the, the stone down the road before it actually builds momentum on its own. And uh, yeah, so it's just, uh, I talked to my co-founder recently about now that this stuff's getting behind me, I need to start like applying to more pitch competitions and like doing these more seed stage things to, you know, get the feedback and put ourselves out there and, you know, uh, casually date these investors or whatever, you know. And what, what's the goal with this startup? Are you, are you trying to like, you know, have like toxins cheaply made or like, are you trying to like decrease death rates or what are you trying yeah, to Yeah, well, because right now snake venom, when you get bit by a snake, and it, it does, in, you know, if you do get venomated and venomated, um, a lot of, cause a lot of times you get bit, it's a dry bite because the snakes just use the venom. They're like, they've evolved to use their venom just to break down their food to help them eat. So if you just like spook a snake and it bites you, like, let's say you lift up a log that a snake's under and it just strikes you, you know, there's a chance you didn't get hit with any venom because, you know, like the snake just got spooked, you know, it wasn't like thinking, oh, I'm going to hunt, I'm getting ready to eat, I need to work this venom and get ready to inject. And so for us, you know, when two, people do get bit, they just get generic doses of antivenom. And a vial of antivenom can cost, it varies widely from hospital to hospital and state to state, I'm sure, but it can cost anywhere from, you know, $1,500 on the low end to $10,000 plus on the high end. And when you get bit, they're just going to hit you with like 10 bottles of antivenom. They're just going to hit you with anti-venom and see how you react. And if you still keep swelling, keep swelling, they'll hit you with more. 
and until that they see that swelling stop. And so it's just this very generic dose. Uh, you know, it's basically like, <laughs> um, it's, it's not a precise science, you know, it's just like, hey, just keep hitting them, keep hitting them. And, you know, there's a lot of, um, what's the word? There's a lot of reasons, I guess, is the easy word to that they do that, right? Because they're just trying to save somebody's limb or life, right? So they're just trying to, to stop the, the venom from coursing through their body. And, and yeah, so our what we're trying to do is get patient data so we can try to more specify the dose based on somebody's height, weight medical history, whether they're diabetic or things like that. So that way, you know, if we can save somebody from going from 25 doses on average of antivenom to 15, we're not only saving them money, but we have more antivenom now that's available for other people to use. And it's really important in like, you know, like rural places around the world, right, which is where the most of the snake bites happen. And it does happen here in the US. Yeah, but many snake bites happen in downtown Dallas, right? Yeah, yeah. Of, you know, in the rural areas. Yeah. So especially as people kind of move out into, you know, away from the city and move into the suburbs, like you're going to start encroaching into those, those lands of being with the animals and and so, yeah, so it's happening more and more and uh, it happens, you know, obviously in third world countries exponentially more. So, but that's why it's important to, you know, it's hard enough to get anti-venom in those places because it has to be uh, refrigerated. And that's another thing that, you know, my co-founder has been talking about and potentially creating a, a temperature stable anti-venom to where you don't have to refrigerate at such a, you know, such a, you know, it's kind of like the COVID vaccine, right? How they have to keep it super refrigerated and shipped all across the country. So it was like this big logistical headache. And so I like to keep the logistical headache out of snake venom and people in third world countries who don't maybe have those refrigerators and those resources to, you know, try to make things better for them. So we're called, obviously someone sees a rattlesnake, they know it's poisonous. They see a king cobra, it's poisonous. But how can you tell, like, this, uh, how can you tell if a snake is venomous, you don't recognize it? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know if there's a... a real way that you can specifically just like tell by looking at it from a distance it's almost like the coral snake you know and it's like the what is it the carter snake or something yeah. they're like you know camouflage should almost be the same yeah, but yeah coral snake ain't no joke yeah i say you're better off just running <laughs> you know just better off going yeah. the other way, avoiding them like the plague yeah coral snake was a water moccasin or a moccasin yeah, yeah. Yeah, those things are i actually just watched uh veritasium i like to watch veritasium on youtube it's like a science channel and he just went to, um, in Australia, they have like a ser ser serpentarium or whatever, like, you know, where they, you know, have a snake husbandry and they milk the snakes for their venom to make anti-venom. And, um, and it's just remarkable the things they do there. And they talk about how, uh, what was it? It's a, a snake from Australia. It's like the most venomous snake on earth. And the guy just talked about how he just got scratched, right? Like the vet, the the snake didn't even bite him. It just scratched him and he ended up in the ICU for like eight days or something. I'm like, geez, that's so crazy. It's enough yes. venom in one bite to kill like 10,000 humans or something crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. So you're doing a lot of entrepreneurship stuff. No. Trying to, trying to. Well, <laughs> imposter syndrome, you're doing yeah. it. So, but you actually also got a master's in science from the entrepreneurship program for our school of business. Mm -hmm. Now talk about this. Some people will say, you know, how, you know, how can you study to be an entrepreneur, right? It's like, you know, you can't study to be a swimmer. You just go do it, right? Yeah, that's the way I talk about, about it. why you decided to get a degree in entrepreneurship and what benefits you got out of it. Yeah, I mean, it really just for the way I, I think about it is it's basically a crash course MBA because the MBA students go for two years and our program is a year long. But we do get other things that are more geared for, towards entrepreneurship, like entrepreneurship strategy and uh, marketing for entrepreneur, like marketing for startups kind of thing obviously marketing as a startup is different for corporations who have giant budgets and can pay for giant marketing teams. So, you know, a lot of the curriculum is geared towards more of the startup world, but for the most part, we're just getting classes in finance, accounting, marketing, negotiations, leadership. Um, yeah. So basically it's just the run in the mill, you know, getting run through business school classes and learning about business in general. And then, like I said, those few, classes they there are tailored more towards entrepreneurship and startup and the lean startup method and mvp minimal viable product and coming up with like these cheaper better ways to go about starting your business i'm guess you were able to make a lot of good connections networking with different investors other entrepreneurs in the, the seattle community mm -hmm. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was, um, that's one of the beautiful things about the program was a big part of it was going around to the local businesses, the local startups and hearing their stories and getting the tour of their, you know, their companies and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, and then of course guests coming over too, and now, you know, not only did we get to go out and visit other businesses, but we had remarkable guests come tell us and come talk to us in the classroom about their stories and how they started their businesses. And, 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 and you're doing this, not like you're just doing this by yourself. You're just doing this in addition to other, other stuff you're doing, right? Uh, in terms of going to the, going to school or yeah, going to school, you're doing your, your startup stuff, your phone case. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's time, part right? of the program is like, you know, instead of for a normal master's thesis that you'd have to like do and spend, you know, time on, we had to put together a business cl- business plan and compete, you know, or apply to this business competition. So yeah, it's just, um, it's a lot different in sense of a normal, like, like for me going to graduate school to get my PhD. It's not like this dissertation that I'm going to have to defend or things like that. You know, it's, um, it's a little bit different. So that's what's, what's cool about it. You know, it's, um, a unique experience I'd say. And that's why, you know, I've had a lot of people reach out to me, like, should I do an MBA or should I do the entrepreneurship program? And it's like, well, you know, how much time do you like, what's your ultimate goal, right? Do you want to just go to business school to learn business and try to work at Amazon? Or do you want to actually try to start your own company and learn about those things? And you can learn. I mean, there are people who do the MBA program who come out and decide like, hey, we're just going to start our own business. So not to say that you have to like go work at Amazon or Microsoft or anything, of course, but, but yeah, you know, it's just one of those things. It's um, where a lot of the MBA students might go in there thinking that's what they want. And then they put together their business plan at the end of their MBA course. And it's really cool. Cause one of the guest speakers that we had in the entrepreneurship program, uh, he was an MBA student there. And he talked about how when him and his two partners for their, you know, their final project of their MBA, they had to put a business plan together and like make this business right for to, to graduate with their MBA. So they did it and they're like, man, this is a great business plan. Like we think we can make this work. So each guy put up 30,000, 33,000, you know, like, you know, with the three of them together, just out of the, out of the gate had a hundred thousand to run with. And they're still going to this day. So it's like, man, you know, how, how cool is that to go to business school and graduate and just start your own business, right? As an MBA student. And- so the people that graduate with you, like how many like actually started a company? How many decided to do some different things? How did that break down? Yeah, I mean, it varies because some people go through and they're just as- associated with companies. Like um, one of my classmates, his dad started the business. So his dad had the patents and his dad, it was like the scientist, you could say. And he was the businessman, right? So dad was doing the science and doing the patents and doing the patient studies or whatever. And he was hustling at business school, making the connections, making the network, learning about investment and this and this and that. And so, so you have like students like him who didn't start the business, but have a business. And, um, and then you have people like me and others who founded and are trying to kick our own businesses off. So it's a whole spectrum of people, you know, some of them didn't have a business at all, or weren't associated with the business, they just had an idea that they wanted to try to turn into a business. And actually, there was a people, a a student before my cohort, where she met people in the program, and kind of like fell onto their team. And she used their business to go through the program. So yeah, it's a a wide spectrum of of entrepreneurs that go through there. So you, you have a lot of passion, a lot of things you're working on. Next, talk about your, uh, how your, you became a re- your path and journey to become a research scientist, like how you got a degree in chemistry, and now you do some really big things as a research scientist at the University of Washington. Talk about the whole journey. Yeah, well, this is a, a bit crazy on this one. I'll have to sit up a little bit. And, oh, man, yeah, because you know, this has been my biggest imposter syndrome, I think, ever in terms of, um, yeah, because, you know, for I've been battling imposter syndrome for a year, being a scientist. And uh, it got me thinking about when I was in the military, like, did I ever have imposter syndrome in the military? Because I always felt like I was super confident in the military, right? They kind of train you to be like that. They don't train you to feel like you don't belong because then we'd have a, a pretty crappy military, right? We train everybody to feel like they're confident in their job to go and fight. And, um, and so I had to do a, a lot of deep thinking and I ended up kind of remembering times when I did serve where I felt like, Hey, I don't belong. This is really weird. But yeah. So for my scientist stuff, 
So, you know, I graduated in 2016 with my degrees. I had already had three years of chemistry research that I had done as an undergrad, and then a year of environmental engineering research as I did that I did as a senior. And that was like through a scholarship and stuff. But so I already had a bunch of research as an undergraduate in science labs. So, I mean, it, technically, I mean, I feel like that point I was pretty much a scientist, right? I had publications, had done ACS conventions and poster presentations and all kinds of stuff. But, but, you know, you never really feel like a scientist. It's like one of these weird things. And um, so, yeah, I graduated in 2016 with my degrees and a bunch of research under my belt. Cause for me, like a lot of engineering students go and do internships. And for me, I, I didn't have that possibility because I had kids, a wife, and my GI Bill, like going to school over the summer was going to pay me more than doing some internship away from my family. And so because of the GI Bill paying me, I was like, man, it's, I'm better off doing research, staying home, taking classes over the summer, doing research over the summer and just, you know, going forward like that. So when I graduated, I had a whole bunch of research and then I couldn't get a job. And I'm like, damn, this sucks. Like, you know, applying, you know, I'm, First, we moved up here and I'm applying in the area, Seattle area, can't get a job. So I'm applying a little bit further out, you know, Washington state. And after months rolled by, couldn't get a job. So I applied all over the country and still couldn't get a job. And, um, you know, got really depressed and my wife ended up, you know, saving us, got her job at Amazon. So while I was applying for those jobs and I couldn't, you know, the way I thought about it was like, cause you know, UW obviously has tons of science jobs. So I was applying for a whole bunch that I qualified for and I wasn't even getting a chance to interview. So I'm like, damn, you know what? I'm just going to call their temp. I'm going to go through their temp agency, uh, UW temp, and I'll do whatever they make me do. I'll be a custodian, like whatever jobs they have, I'll take. So my first job with them was a custodian for like two or three weeks where I was just scrubbing floors, wiping walls, like whatever. And in my mind, I was like, yo, like I'm just going to do enough temp jobs where I'll get my foot in the door of a lab eventually and I'll get in. And so, yeah, that first job... I was, you know, doing janitorial stuff for about three weeks. And then the next temp job, I worked at transportation services, which is basically like doing janitorial work on the cars, right? I was cleaning the cars out, vacuuming the cars, fueling them up and just kind of, you know, like run of the mill vehicle maintenance. No, we're like not maintenance, but because they have the maintenance bay where the actual mechanics work, but just like, cause it's like glorified brown bear. You, you know what I'm saying? Like just driving around, taking care of the, making sure they're hey, clean. Hey, Ricardo, real quickly, can you talk about your mindset? Cause I think a lot of people have the attitude now that it's like, you know, I'm a chemist, I'm a scientist. Uh, this is below me. This is beneath me, right? Can you just talk about the mindset you had? Like, you know, you had it, of course, I'm sure your family and kids motivate you to do this stuff too, but talk about the mindset, like, you know, I'm going to do whatever's necessary to put me in and set me up for success. Yeah. So, you know, that's the way I've always thought about it was like, yeah, I have these degrees in this research, but I mean, I'm not below doing what I got to do to get my foot in the door, you know? So, yeah, I, you know, I feel like that's a lot of how people feel these days um, in terms of their job. Like, man, I love janitors. Like, I don't know how people feel about, you know, but I know they're like always kind of shunned and looked down upon by a lot of society. But man, without them, like shit would be dirty, you know, <laughs> like they take they take care of us, you know? And so that's why I, I don't mind, man. We got to get the stuff. And then whenever I was in the lab, I'm like cleaning stuff up all the time, making sure the lab's clean. But yeah, so, you know, it's just one of those things where I'm not, you know, below any job because all these jobs are important and we all got a job to do to make things happen and get stuff done at the end of the day. So, but I, I think that's a thing that a lot of people fall into is like, yeah, they get their degrees and they feel like, yeah, now I shouldn't have to take out the trash because I have a degree now. And it's so funny because whenever I was at work, when I'm taking like bins down, like trash bins down to the trash to take them out myself, because one of my coworkers asked me to do it. And um, so one of the other scientists saw me taking bins down, like in the elevator, she's like, you take the trash down? I'm like, yeah, why not? Like I got asked to do it and I'm trying to help my coworkers out. So I'm going to take the trash down. And so, yeah, it's just one of those mentalities where, you know, I don't, I don't get it. You know, like, I don't get why people think if they have money or status or power, like, man, there's no one's above cleaning stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like clean, everybody should be cleaning the room every, you know, not like Jordan Peterson, maybe, you know, like dress, right, dress everything. But <laughs> so you're doing it, you're doing the temp jobs and how does that parlay into like, like doing the real stuff you want to do? Yeah. So, um, so I was doing those temp jobs and like I said, the first one was custodial. Second one was basically custodial for vehicles. The third one, um, was, one I'm trying to think of the 
if the surplus came first or not. Yeah, I think it was just those two. And then my wife got the job at Amazon. So then I, you know, stopped trying to get these jobs. And then uh, a year later, she left her job at Amazon. I'm like, oh, who knows how long it's going to be before you find work again or before I find work. So I just hopped back into UW Temp. And I ended up, my first job back was working with uh, UW Surplus. And UW Surplus just goes around the campus to pick up stuff that they're going to surplus to sell online and just make a little bit money off of and, you know, put that money back towards something else. So for about two weeks, and I felt bad because my wife got a job pretty quick. Like in our mind, we don't know how long it's going to be before we get another job, right? So I, so I hopped into this temp work and did all the training. And then like right after I got done training, I'm like, I'm sorry, guys, but my wife got a job. Like I got to go. And, um, but yeah, so it was basically like nothing custodial, but I was just going around like a mover, right? From, I went from, I got promoted from a move, uh, from a janitor to a mover. And then, um, yeah, so then my wife got a job again and I just went back to being, um, stay at home dad. Then, you know, everything happened with my book, my patent COVID or, and actually the master's degree and then COVID hit. And after I graduated in 2020, I, you know, graduated foster business school and I'm, I'm applying back at labs. So like, man, I just want to get back in the lab. I want my PhD. I need to get experience under my belt so I can get into a PhD program. So I'm applying at labs, applying to labs and still no love. So I was like, oh, UW temp, let me go back to UW temp. Maybe they can help me get in the lab. So I went back to them and they're like, no, we don't have any lab jobs, but we do have this uh, freshman application processor job that you can do remote from home. And it's a three month gig. So I'm like, oh, that doesn't sound too bad. I was making like $22 an hour remote from home. And so, you know, it, it was so sucking because like, man, I can't work behind a computer eight hours a day. You know, like it was it was hard. But, you know, I did that for three months, all of November, all of December and all of January, I want to say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All of November, all of December, all of January. And uh, so for three months, man, every day, eight hours a day, just going through freshman applications and making sure they had all their classes taken that they needed to whatever, whatever. And then when it was all said and done, UW came, temp came to me and they were like, Hey, Ricardo, with your degrees and your experience and your military, whatever, uh, we feel like you'd be a good fit for this job. And it's a job um, helping a project called the waves. It's a, the wave survey project uh, by lab medicine. And, you know, basically he said that, you know, they're, testing for people for COVID across the state. You're going to be the logistics guy helping ship stuff across the state. You're going to have to, you know, figure that stuff out. Uh, do you think you can do it? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So they said, set up the interview and man, it was so crazy uh, because when I did the interview, they're telling me about the job. So, you know, my boss at the time, she was telling me like, yeah, you know, you're going to have to send stuff across the state. You're going to have to receive pallets and palletize stuff and send it out. And I'm like, wait, I'm gonna have to like, like make pallets of things and wrap them. She's like, yeah, I was like, wow, I literally used to do that as a night stalker at a grocery store before I joined the army at HEB, you know, I used to be a night stalker at HEB. So she's like literally describing to me stuff that I was like, oh, I'm a master palletizer. And like, I can make pallets like, you know, like no one's business because I'm good at Tetris. I can see how, you know, I'm good at spatial awareness type stuff so I can make it work. And so like that really, I think sealed the deal. And like, not only did I, you know, able to do it, but I had this experience palletizing stuff and she, for her she just felt better because it's a lot of medical stuff so she's like yo i don't want to hire somebody and you're familiar with lab equipment so she's like yo i don't want to tell you something and hey go grab the centrifuge and then someone else be like what's a centrifuge or what's you know what's a you know um pipettes or something you know like just go grab these things yeah you knew the language yeah yeah so that's what a big part of why she wanted me to is like based on your research you have research experience you have military experience and you know it just seemed like you'd be a good fit so I did that for about six weeks. And while I was there at Lab Med, you know, I'm virology is there where I was working. And so I just started networking with the people there. And one, uh, one of the ladies in charge, I was talking to her about how I have a VA appointment. I was like, man, I got a VA appointment. I hate going to the VA. Like, I call them the morgue prep facility, man. They're just getting you ready for the morgue. They're not trying to help you most of the time. It's my experience anyway. I know people were like, oh, VA is great, but... So yeah, I'm like, oh, I got to go deal with the VA. And she's like, well, UW's got great benefits. You should look at job openings here and you get a job here. You can get some good VA or good uh, UW benefits. So I was like, okay. So that night I went home and I just looked at virology and what they had. And there was research scientist positions available. So I'm like, yeah, no clue, did you? Yeah, I had no clue. I was like, wow. So research scientist one, entry level research scientist positions. And 
And so uh, I went back to her the next day and I was like, hey, remember how you said to go apply? I was like, well, I looked at these research scientist positions and I'm going to apply it when she's like, you qualify for those? I was like, yeah. She's like, okay, apply. So I did. And, you know, basically that's what helped me get the interview with my boss, right? Like my boss now, you know, whenever I was like just brand new and had to do the interview with her in person, I, uh, I just begged her. I just begged her. I was like, look, I know it's been five years since I've been in the lab. I know I've never worked in a lab like this. And, you know, I don't have any research experience that's relevant to this, but you know, I'm a fast learner. I'll work hard and I don't care if it's full-time, part-time volunteer, like whatever capacity you want to let me in, just please let me in, you know, just there begging her. And, um, yeah, she, uh, she ended up giving me the job obviously. And within a few weeks, they, it was kind of crazy because, you know, I got the job and at first I was training to do, you know, one thing. And then there was this guy who, who on, and on the NGS team, which is where I'm on now, the next generation sequencing team, he was getting ready to go on vacation for a week. So I was like this fresh hire. And they're like, yo, just shadow this guy for a week. He's going to train you because next week he's getting ready to go. And we want you to be able to cover for him. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So I shadowed him for a week. He was gone. Everything went well. He comes back and I'm basically like looped in. That's how I got looped into the NGS team. Cause I was just this, this kind of wander on, you know, in virology, right? This research scientist new hire with no experience, just kind of floating, picking up little experience where I could here and there learning what I could. And then they're like, yo, this guy's going on vacation. You need to learn what he does and cover for him. And that's how I ended up on the NGS team because the guy going on vacation was on the NGS team. And so, yeah, I covered for him and that's where I've been ever since. And, you know, it was crazy because within two months you know because i worked during the day for about eight months and then for like the past three or four months i've been working the evenings but when i was working in the day i was working the end of the pipeline you know creating what's called libraries and loading the sequencers to sequence you know for the different variants of covid or whatever other viruses were feeding them and um so for after about two months two or three months the packet of paperwork ended up on my desk for like all the paperwork that gets done for all this, you know, what we were doing to to keep track of. And in my mind, I was thinking like, man, they just put it on my desk because my boss doesn't have any room on her desk, you know? And so I'm just like, oh, still just flying blind, doing my thing, making sure everything's running smooth. And for months, you know, the entire time I was working days, things were super smooth. Everybody's happy. It's like greatest thing ever. And then I shift to nights and it was like a, it was a perfect storm of shit really is what it was. We got new hires and anytime you get new hires, like things are not going to go perfect, right? You know, we're going to have failed plates. The quality, the QC is going to fail sometimes, right? Cause we have new hires who are going to, you know, make their mistakes. So it was a perfect storm of new hires coming in three of them, which was like the biggest kind of hiring, like maybe even four of them, three or four of them. So a bunch of new hires, me moving to evenings, machines, breaking logistical, shipping like we were running out of chemical you know how the shipping towards the end of the year was like and getting anything was a a pain you know so like all these uh chemical reagents we're waiting for on back order and like just all this headache and um and then at that point i realized like they were getting me in trouble they're getting mad at me and i'm like why are you getting mad at me i'm like i'm nobody i've none of this experience and then i realized like man i was kind of in charge of so when we sequence for covid specifically for covid Um, when we sequence, there are two pipelines. There is a surveillance pipeline where like, it's just like mass testing sites where people go through those drive, drive drive-through testing sites. And then there's the clinical side where people go to the doctor, the doctor swabs them and lets them know, Hey, you have COVID. And so I was in charge of the surveillance pipeline and my coworker that I had covered for for that week, he was in charge of the study samples like Pfizer, Janssen, and all these other study samples we're getting, excuse me. And uh, so he was in charge of those, you know, the study samples and the clinical samples, and I was in charge of the surveillance samples. And so, yeah, you know, I'm just doing my job, like running these surveillance samples, feeding the sequencer. And then when I moved to nights and things fell apart, like not because of me, not because I was, you know, not that I had it propped up on my shoulder. I'm not trying to make it seem like that. But when I moved to nights because of the perfect storm I talked about before, things started to fall apart. And I started to get in trouble. I'm like, wait a minute, why are you getting me in trouble? Like, I want to do the work, but my machine's broken. Like, I want to do the work, but I'm out of chemicals. Like, I don't, you know, like, believe me, I'm frustrated too. And then I realized like, man, I was, I was leading the surveillance side of that. Like in my mind, I was never leading it. I was just helping it and like, you know, riding along, right. Just like riding along for the ride. 
but I was leading that for a long time and I didn't even realize it until I moved to nights. I'm like, oh damn, like had I known I was, you know, whenever I was working days, I thought I was riding passenger. I'm just like, you know, buffing the car, <laughs> keeping it a little bit clean, you know, making sure it's fueled up. But had I known I was driving it, man, everything would have been detailed, you know, <laughs> like it would have been a lot different. So it was this kind of weird realization, like, man, I hadn't been in a lab in five years. And they just kind of handed me the keys to this million dollar sequencer, <laughs> you know, like just take care of it. So Ricardo, let's go back to the research scientists, but first let's go back to their mindset, right? Let's talk about veteran mindset when they get out of the army. I think a lot of veterans too, they're like, I'm a veteran. I was in the army, Navy. I actually have to do these type of jobs, right? They think they're better because oh, I served in Afghanistan, Iraq, where the kids would be. And then a lot of senior ranking military officials are like, you know, I was a SAR major. I was an E7. You know, I did this army. I should do the same thing in the civilian world. Talk about, well, Maybe your skills match up, but it's like, you know, you're not going to have a, you're not going to work at Amazon for 10 years and go to the army and become a, a lieutenant colonel, right? Yeah, yeah. Can you talk about how veterans kind of get their mindset wrong? Yeah, I mean, I, that's a big reason why I try to avoid working for the federal government, because I know a lot of ex-military work for the federal government. So I'm like, man, I really don't want to have that environment at work where some guy just feels like he was a retired you know, major, you know what I'm saying? Like, man, yeah. like that's past life. Don't try to bring that here now. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's just um, one of those things. And it, I, I also feel it all depends like on your job too, right? Like if you were um, a military intelligence officer who, you know, never really had to grind as a, you know, in, in the grunt ways, you know, like the way we grind. And then when you get out, you maybe you just feel extra, you know, I wouldn't say entitled, but just like, like if I was an infantry officer and I got out and somebody asked me to do some grimy, dirty crap, or I clean stuff up and whatever, I'd be like, okay, I was sleeping in dirt anyway. But as opposed to maybe MI who maybe had a little bit of a bougier experience or something. And they'd be like, man, I didn't even do that in the military. What makes you think I'm going to do that now? You know? So I don't know. It's, uh, it's hard to psychologically diagnose, you know, people like that in terms of how they're going to think about it. But it's, uh, you know, a lot of things in terms of, what they did in the past and you know like i said i feel like if you're a combat arms and you went overseas like you you know you, step in, saying, dirt, you step in dirt you know yeah, yeah. No, no tents just on up you know prayer ground and getting three or four hours of sleep at night and mm -hmm. freezing cold yeah i actually i just um you know on my facebook page i just share a bunch of like science and you know science videos or information and quotes and stuff and one of the things on my memories recently was and it was kind of ironic how I came across it because it was, you know, at the time it was from like 2020, the COVID scare, people buying up all the toilet paper. Right. And it was literally, a, um, I, don't, I don't know if it's a poem or just like a short saying or something, but it was uh, from a soldier in World War One, And it was just talking about how like they're in the trenches and they need to use the restroom, but they know if they come out the trench, they're going to die. So they're like in there just crapping in their hands and throwing it out and just like, oh my goodness, like those you know, like, they, like well, what's the saying? You got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I'm saying like those guys, had they survived the war, got out and got into the civilian world, like, you know, maybe some of them might, you know, maybe half of them would be like, man, I'm not going to take shit out ever again. I, I lived in the shit, you yeah. know, like, and that's the way I felt about picking up after like cigarette butts. Like, man, I'm, you know, I'm not a cigarette smoker. I'm not going to pick up cigarette butts, you know, like make the cigarette smokers do that, yeah. you know, but like now, you know, if it's my sidewalk or my community, you know, it's a different mentality when you're a, 20 year old kid and yeah. you know you're being forced by some sergeant to police call the parking lot and, yeah. you know what i'm saying like hey, i'll pick up the paper but you yeah. cigarette smokers pick up after yourself hey we're gonna take a quick break right all right yeah, yeah, yeah sounds good we gotta use the bathroom fast okay yeah <laughs> no problem right. or else you if you want to can you uh, while i'm gone talk about how you get during join the army sniper school that kind of stuff uh yeah yeah i'll okay. talk about okay. sniper all school right. all right so or my journey to being a sniper i guess would be a, a quick fun story so I started out as a 240 machine gunner in a brand new unit, 5th Brigade, 2nd Inf Infantry Division. And uh, when, we, when I first got there, no vehicles, no weapons, no buildings, no anything. And um, yeah, so as the months rolled by, they're putting us in platoons and battalions and, you know, military units. And, you know, as the months rolled by, we get vehicles, weapons, gear and stuff to train with. And I started out as a 240 machine gunner which kind of, you know, hurt my heart a little bit because I grew up on a ranch, like I talk about, talked about earlier and shooting rifles my whole life. So I felt like that was going to be the way I could best contribute. So when they put a machine gun in my hands, especially the 30 pound empty 240 hog, 
was like, man, this thing weighs like an eighth of what I do or a sixth of what I do. Like I'm not very big and lots of other big guys here. So, uh, yeah, so it was kind of like, you know, it hurt my heart a little bit, but you know, you get a machine gun and you take it to a range and you start to fire that fully automatic death machine. It makes you kind of happy. So I got over it pretty quick. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, I just started as a machine gunner. And one morning they asked, you know, it was a brand new unit. So we had spots to fill. They asked who wants to try out for the sniper team. And uh, I raised my hand and went through a 65 hour tryout and uh, got selected as one of three guys out of like maybe 15 or so who tried out. And after that, not long after that, which is, you know, writing my book kind of made me realize like how fast all these events happened back to back. Because in my mind, they, there was like, you know, three to six months gap between some of the stuff. And so not long after making the sniper team, I got sent to um, main post to learn how to be a sniper. And that was a three week course. And that was another thing that was an interesting insight for my book was I thought in my mind, it was at least four weeks. And um, yeah, it just ended up being three weeks. But I asked my old sniper buddy, recently, I was like, yo, man, how long was how long? Because like, I have my certificate certificate from graduating, and it does show dates, it's about three weeks. And I'm like, man, was it this long? And he's like, yeah, it was three weeks long. But we only but we also worked on Saturdays. <laughs> and so I'm like, Oh, man, no wonder why it felt four weeks long, because it was three weeks long, but we worked on Saturdays. So it was basically four weeks long. So quick lesson, uh, never drink a Modelo and a Coke right before you do a podcast. <laughs> Now you're a good man. So I just talked about how, um, you know, how I started out, no weapons, and then brand new, brand new unit, 240 gunner, tried out for the sniper team, made the sniper team, and then within like, and I just talked about how um, an interesting insight in writing my book was, in my mind, from when I made the sniper team and I learned how to be a sniper, there was like a three month gap in my mind um, from from me making the sniper team and going to that initial school. And then when I wrote my book, it was literally like back to back. I made the sniper team and like a week or two later, they sent me to the school and I'm like, damn. Like, and you had experience shooting, you know, from your days in Texas Ranch and like you just. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean. Um, it wasn't me a sniper, but one of your childhood, childhood juniors too. Yeah. yeah. Being a, a sniper, an astronaut and a fighter pilot. Those are like my, my elementary level mm -hmm. dreams. And then of course, as you grow up, our dreams die. And then at that point, you know, everybody tells you, well, choose a career, right? At, at, when you're young, they're dreams. When yeah. you're when you're in junior high, it's career. That's, that's and then so, when you're in high school, it's all dead. That's such bad advice, right? You tell people like, you know, in a tenth grade, ninth grade, what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, give people options. Let them, let them explore, like do different things, right? Let yeah. them like pick 10 things, you know, because you never know what you're gonna be good at until you do it, right? Yeah, exactly. And so um, so yeah, you know, I got thrown into learning how to be the sniper. And in my mind, it was a long four week course because sniper school, when I went was five weeks. It was, and, was that at here at JBLM? You had to go somewhere no, else? No, I went to Fort Benning for sniper okay. school. And so when I went, it was five weeks. It might be like six or seven weeks now because they made it longer, not long after I went through because they were implementing a whole new sniper system. So they had, to, you know, get more time in sniper school to train the students on this new sniper system. And snipers, do you, do you just use one weapon or you have to use various weapons? Yeah, yeah. We do pistol call. You, we shoot a pistol and we have to do pistol call in sniper school. And then we shoot the Barrett. And it, and then for the rifles, you do day and night shoots. So I don't think we do a Barrett night shoot though. I mean, like I said, it could, could have changed by now because I know they do a lot of different crazy things now. And, um, and so... So yeah, it's mostly Barrett range, bolt action, M24 range, pistol shooting. Um, I don't think they had a new sniper weapon system yet whenever I went through sniper school. Or if they did, they were just like showing it to us a little bit. They were like, you know, we're not going to give you the full run through because it was like a class or two later that they did implement it. And then with, by the end of the year, they're like, yeah, this is too cramped. We I, I guess time. you have to be an expert everywhere. Right? You can't be like, yeah, you have to qualify expert in order to go. But okay. of course, to qual you know, if your unit wants to send you, they'll send you to the range with 200 rounds of ammo until you qualify yeah. expert. <laughs> yeah, everyone will qualify. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so yeah, so then, you know, did that pre sniper training for three weeks. And that was hell on earth. I, you know, in my mind, it was four weeks long, because we ran every day. But it was three weeks, but we worked on Saturday. So that's why it just felt so long. But yeah, you know, normally in the military, it's one day muscle failure, next day, you know, cardio, muscle failure, cardio, you alternate. 
And uh, man, not in that school. It was just all run us to, I, I think they were just trying to get dudes to quit, honestly. And there was one guy who did quit. And, um, but yeah, man, they just ran us into the run around the airfield, run hills, run just uh, the most hurry. And I wanted to quit too. You know, I was like, oh, I'd always think about it like, man, fuck this. Like, I just want to quit. But yeah, of course, yeah, I, was yeah. I, I did OCS at Fort Benning. Yeah, it was, it was no joke. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was tough. And that was just the pre sniper stuff. And then when you go to real sniper school, and I don't know how it is now, but when I went, it was, like I said, only five weeks and they try to bust you off for like the first three or four days, you know, they make you do PT and try to get the guys that are going to quit to quit. And then, um, they're like, okay, guys, we don't have time to smoke you. Like we want to, we want to try to break y'all all off, but we don't have time where we have to train y'all with the, about the real sniper stuff. So, so I hope if they made it longer, they added some extra time to try to smoke dudes and, and break them off. Cause you know, like any military combat school, it's an important part of, of weeding the people out who don't want to be there. And I mean, sniper school, even without that, has a 50% attrition rate. So like the stalk week where you got to spend the whole week, you know, gilly suiting up and going and hunting the cadre down. Um, that's really what gets most guys. Cause and being a sniper, I guess, has to be lonely, right? Because you're either on mission all by yourself pretty much. And yeah, you know, you are your small element, you know, your spotter and security or, or your shooter and your security or your shooter and spotter, you know, at most three ideally you know because the bigger the team gets yeah. the more you have to be accountable. like because as a sniper team if you have a security element with you we always felt you know i don't know what the sop is but we always felt like you know they're attached to us they're our security we're responsible for them so we always try to keep it to ourselves or a small security team because we don't want a whole bunch of people attached to us and be responsible for a whole bunch of dudes you know yeah yeah and so how long were you a sniper uh, pretty much my whole military career. You know, I started out as a 240 gunner early on, and then I made the sniper team in 20, yeah, 2017. I would say it was early 2017 when I made the sniper team. And then I went to sniper, oh, 2017, 2007. I'm sorry. I'm adding, I've been doing that lately, adding decades to my stories. <laughs> but yeah, I think it was like 2007 when I made the sniper team. And then I went to sniper school in early 2008 and deployed in 2009 and do you still shoot uh not as much as i'd like you know when i was in texas in december i did do a little bit of blasting but you know i for me i don't like to shoot i don't like indoor ranges and it's hard to find a, an outdoor range out around here yeah and i, know, I like I to know, shoot I know, distance. I know they have a couple down at fort lewis that's kind of too far for you to go yeah to shoot. yeah and i like to shoot at least 300 meters you know because you know even with the little m4 like you know that's a decent little shot with an m4 300 but with a bolt action, of course, 500 minimum would be ideal. You have a favorite weapon to shoot? Um, I, Yeah, I'd, I'd really just like the bolt action okay. Remington 700. You know, it's just kind of what I grew up shooting and mm -hmm. what I'm comfortable with. So it's a, it's, it's a, you know, it's a very good sniper system because it's light and it's effective. Like it's, it's a good weapon. So, you know, it's just something I'm comfortable with. It's funny because growing up, my dad always tell, would always tell me, son this is a sniper rifle i'm like that shut up like you don't know what you're talking about and then when i made the sniper team the first gun they handed me was the same gun i'd been shooting my whole life i'm like damn dad was right so are you going to teach your kids to shoot are you already have you already taught them how to yeah shoot? yeah um next, last time we went down to texas as a family you know i did give excuse me i did give my oldest daughter some trigger time and my youngest was too young at the mm -hmm. time but yeah you know i'm gonna teach them to shoot and do you do, you do any hunting um down there i do not so much around here because yeah. i mean hunting up here is weird it's one of those things that i learned like you know i'm sure because a lot of the land is obviously you know private land and then you have to try to hit public land or get leases or whatever and uh the lottery system like to hunt any of the cool game yeah. here and it's a lottery system so it's always, you know it seems too complicated for me to even want to bother with and especially for someone like me who doesn't have all the time and you know, to kind of research and, you know, because it seems like it's a lot of work. I mean, I'm a part of the hunting groups on Facebook. So I always see these guys talking about like, you know, trying to just go out to scout locations because they're like, not only when you sign up for this game, you have to sign up for certain locations. Like I think they're like GMUs or something. So yeah, it's a, it's, it's a different world over here compared to Texas where you can just go buy a you know a deer a white tailed deer license and go blast something whether it's in your property or a buddy's property and the beauty beautiful thing about texas is like you can have a little 10 acre spot because in texas you just need 10 acres to legally mm -hmm. shoot so what a lot of my you know people around where i grew up have they just have like small plots you know 10 20 acres 
and then you can just go hunt on that because as long as it's not high fence you know the deer are just going to wander around so you really don't need a huge ranch to down there to actually get deer on your land you just need to make sure you're not surrounded by high fence because then you will you know won't have any deer on your land if they don't start there you know if you're all high fenced off and that's one thing that i think why we have deer on my property now because our fence and uh, along the highway isn't high fenced off so deer can willy-nilly jump in and out of my property and so yeah like the other i want to say one of the sides is high fence i think only one of the three sides is high fence so most of my property isn't high fence which is why we're getting deer on our property now like eight point bucks and like damn i couldn't even imagine a spike or a doe like now we have eight point bucks on my property it's kind of weird yeah so i just thought of this funny story it it was on it wasn't someone says me a long time ago right and so it was a radio show and this lady called in and they're talking about i think it was in minnesota right how all these deers will get hit on the highway right they can get hit on the highway Mm -hmm. and the lady called in well i don't understand why why is there a sign that says deer crossing here like if we would simply move this deer crossing sign, there would be no deer crossing here and they will live. And they're like, they're like flabbergasted. Like, I don't understand. Can you say that again, ma'am? I mean, yes. You know, all these deers are getting killed on the highway because it says right there, deer crossing. And the, and the deer are crossing here, the deer crossing sign is. <laughs> and it's like, are you serious, ma'am? Like, do like, you hear what you're hearing? You what you're saying right now? And she's like, yeah, you know, the government or state, whoever's in charge of the sign needs to move the deer crossing sign. So you're saying the deer are reading the sign right. and crossing right here. Yeah, I mean that's the signs are right, so they can tell the deer where to cross that. <laughs> and I just always remember the story. I think about deer, right? Like, did this lady really believe this? Like, mm-hmm. and and of course it had to be a coincidence that like, there's a lot of deer getting killed crossing this area, right? Mm-hmm. But it was because it's for the cars to slow down. Of oh, course, yeah, the cars yeah. were, those cars weren't slowing down; just yeah. people driving the deer, right? Well, it's like I was telling you before. You know, it was like that driving with in December with my dad when I was in Texas. Like, man, like you're driving in every every mile it seemed like you were you know deer were running across the road i'm like man it was never like this growing up like yeah there was the deer here and there occasionally you see them on the sides of the road but now there was dozens and dozens and dozens of deer along the side of the road like dead and alive and i'm like oh damn like this yeah. is crazy this is- so, so i live in dupont it's kind of crazy down there too right with raccoons and coyotes like mm. every day we had like three or four raccoons in our yard they go to, to, to our front porch of neighbors and yesterday i was driving down to dupont i looked aside there was a pack of six coyotes walking down the walking trail don't walk down the sidewalk Damn. like what in the world like going? they own the place yeah like what, what, what's going on like these counties are for a family stroll in the, right. the sidewalk what the hell that's hilarious so next um let's talk about your new book born born to fail and you five two experience that's kind of intertwined right mm-hmm. so let's talk about that like what what made you write the book in the first place what motivated you to write the book <laughs> well that actually kind of started out as in garrison uh, the NCOs and officers were just lying about any little thing. So it was like one example was what really made me buy a voice recorder. Right? I started to record my conversations in secret with these people because I wasn't going to, I was like, man, I'm going to start recording because I don't want to get in trouble for something that someone who has authority over me is going to lie about. And so uh, what made me go buy the voice recorder was I was at my wall locker, right? Because I lived off post. So I had wall lockers, you know, at the work area. So I'm on my wall locker, just doing what I'm going to get, getting what I'm going to get. And then my platoon sergeant's like, Perez, why the fuck aren't you ready yet? You know, well, I'm like, ready for what? <laughs> you know, like, what am I, what, what's going on? He's like, what? Sergeant, you know, whoever didn't tell you. And I'm like, and then Sergeant, whoever walked up right behind him. And before I could even say anything, and he was like, oh, hey, Sergeant, did you tell Perez? And he's like, Roger, Sergeant, I told him. And I'm like, oh, you lying. You didn't tell me shit. But you know, if you say like hey i didn't tell him now i'm not going to get in trouble and now you're going to be the one who gets in trouble so he lied and after that i was like man this is petty shit if you're going to lie over petty shit like who knows what you're going to be willing to lie about so that's when i went and bought the voice recorder and started recording my conversations with these important people and uh yeah so i started just recording a whole bunch of conversations before i deployed and when i was deployed i recorded conversations typed in my laptop and mostly wrote in my little green like five by seven you know the military issue green book actually i think i have it here so my green book so i started writing in it and it's basically cover to cover yes it's you know cover to cover so whenever I was out on mission, since I didn't have my laptop because I was on mission, I was just writing in this book because, I mean, it, and it was insane, the stuff we were experiencing and going through and the way they were treating me and, you know, the guys I love. So 
So I started just writing a whole bunch of stuff. And like I said, that was just when I was out on mission, when I was, I can type tenfold faster than I can write. So whenever I was on my computer, I was just going crazy. And uh, I always wanted to tell the story of what we were experiencing and, and what, you know, what was going on. And um, so, yeah, and then, you know, what really spurred me to write was in 2018, uh, one of the guys we served with lost his life to cancer, to like a super rare form of cancer than only a couple hundred people have ever had. And it got me thinking about like the water they had as drinks. They were just pallets of water out in the sun. And that's what killed me about being over there is like I would spend like I would spend easy 10 minutes at a pallet so I could get water for me to drink. I would dig through the middle of the pallet, open up a water, take a sip, taste like pure plastic, dump it because I don't want anybody to drink it. Just dump it. Next, next. Oh, potable. Next, next, next. Potable. You know, so I'd spend time there just looking for water that was tolerable to drink. And so whenever he got sick from this rare form of cancer, I was like, I couldn't help but think of that, that poison water they were making us drink. So I just wrote this quick op-ed. I did it in like 15 minutes. I was just like so mad that at the world about, you know, this young 28, 29 year old man survived war, came home and got sick to one of the rarest forms of cancer ever. And so it just made me want to write, you know, and I wrote that op-ed and people liked it. They're like, yeah, but you get the, some of the passion, all right? Like you wrote it because you were mad, like, and maybe some fact check yourself with some of the stuff, add some sources. So I started to do some research and, and stuff like that. So, so yeah, I just started with that. And um, I wrote this op-ed, I sent it to the Seattle Times. And then I also was just Google searching uh, water quality issues, like water quality articles, because in my mind, I'm thinking like, oh, if I can find a reporter that's reporting on water quality, maybe they'd be interested in what I wrote it, what I wrote about the water we drink overseas. And at the time, there was a whole bunch of articles being written by the military times about water quality on bases because of the PFAS and the military, the aircraft foam that runs off and contaminates the water and stuff. People were getting sick on military bases because of it. And so I reached out to her. It was like a Friday. I reached out and I emailed her. I was like, hey, I wrote this. I see you're writing water quality articles about stuff in the States. I wrote this about water quality overseas. Um, if you can connect me with somebody who cares about water quality overseas, that would be great. But whatever, whatever. And so she emailed me back through her iPhone because, you know, whenever you message, respond on email, it's sent from your iPhone or whatever. So she responded back and forth to me over the weekend through her iPhone, through her personal messaging, you know, her, her phone. And um, she was like, yeah, this is great. Do you want to run it in the military times? And I was like, well, oh, that would be cool. But I would love it in the Seattle times first, because I would like a civilian audience, like us in the military know each other's problems. Like, you know, if I say, hey, water's making us sick overseas, they'd be like, yeah, we remember drinking that poison water. But I wanted a, a civilian audience to see it first, at least. So I told her like, hey, please wait, let's see what Seattle times says. And, you know, we'll take it from there. And then, you know, that following week, Seattle Times rejected the piece. And then I emailed her back like, hey, um, you know, they rejected me. I'm happy to run it now. And like cricket, she never got back to me. And I couldn't help but feel like she went to work, you know, because she was all for it over the weekend. And then I feel I can't help but feel like she went to work on Monday, talked to her superiors, did some research into my unit and decided like, no, that's not. Yeah, leave that one alone. Yeah, yeah, leave that one alone. And so whenever I didn't hear back from her, I'm like, damn, how weird is that for her to be like super for it, messaging me back and forth over the weekend, right? From her personal phone. And then on Monday, crickets. And so I said, you know what, man? People think they're going to silence this story. So I wrote my book. <laughs> so yeah, man, I just wanted to write the story of what really happened and like, and then before that, earlier in that year, the Seattle Times had invited me to give that talk that I did for them, uh, their Ignite Education Lab. And so that's what really spurred it to be a memoir rather than just, just than a, a book about my military service. Because the way I thought about it was if I told the story of how I ended up in that unit, if it convinced one or two out of every 10 readers that it's real, like, because I felt if I just wrote about what we experienced, nobody would believe it because the shit was crazy. So if I wrote, about how I ended up in that unit. Well, you know, if I can convince a handful of people more per 10, 20, that it's true, then hey. Because five two only lasted, you know, for like three or four or five years, right? Four years, yeah, for uh, 2006, 2010. And then they like strike everything from them for like all the army history or something like that, or? Yeah, pretty much. It's funny because I was talking to uh, another podcast host recently about it and they're like, yeah. Oh, because it was, um, I told them about how the Army Times did an article on our brigade and on the front cover, in big bold letters, it said the brigade from hell. And I just, I was already out at the time. And I saw it at um, 
you know, like the Walmart drone span away and stuff around the base, the Walmarts carried those military time stuff. So like a whole rack and a whole row, just like the brigade from hell. And I saw that with my wife. I was like, oh, that's funny. I bet you that's about us, like jokingly, you know? And sure enough, it was about fifth brigade. And I'm like, oh, damn, I wish I would have actually flipped it open and be like, damn, this is about, I would have bought like 10 copies to have to, you know, save it. And I was telling somebody that and they're like, oh, well, go look online. You know, you should be able to find some online record of it. Man, I've, I have found things from the Army Times, the Military Times about the unit, but they're dead links. They're dead video links. They're dead text links. And I'm like, whoa, this is really weird. Like, didn't Fatu have like, like people like smoking marijuana, yeah, like yeah. killer teams and mm-hmm. like this all kind of craziness? Yeah, I mean, the biggest drama out of all that is definitely the kill team, you know, because the drug use, that happens every deployment, you know, like the drug and alcohol abuse, like dudes getting shipped alcohol up there or whatever, like. Shit's been going on since Vietnam and then some, you know, like dudes using their shotgun barrels yeah. to smoke weed. So, you know, for obviously it's one thing to smoke a joint in the combat zone and purposely murder civilians. So, you know, the drug stuff is obviously shunned, right? People, soldiers shouldn't be, you know, getting toasted while they're trying to, you know, do their job. Yeah. But, you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, it's a, a crazy place to be. And man, you got to, hold on to sanity any way you can because you know you got to go out there every day and you know you never know when that last you know mission is gonna you know when that next mission is gonna be the last one so i remember what's in our like, army times where one of the lieutenant colonel one of the battalion commanders accused of brigade command of like having like you know send out revenge teams because like he was mad he was uh, mad at iraqis for killing some people so he's taking out afghanistan afghanistan people like the, the the Taliban. Oh, and of course, when five two first hit, or they were y'all were getting like slaughtered pretty much, right? I mean, you all getting slaughtered, like ID hits like almost daily basis. Mm-hmm. Y'all y'all are areas of Afghanistan we had never been in before. Yeah. This all this bad stuff went on. And then like it's like do this brigade commander kind of break and like you no know, go on a, a revenge thing, you know. I mean that was out there too. Yeah, that was a big that's like the big um if you search fifth brigade, that's a lot of what you find on the internet is talking about the leadership being gung ho and not implementing it was it like Petraeus, General Petraeus's mm-hmm. uh coin, right? The counterinsurgency to go and create these um a humanitarian yeah, type I, I missions. Think the attack command accused the real command of actually having uh body counts. Hmm. Like, you know, we're back in Vietnam, we had body counts. Uh, well, body counts is 10,000 Vietnam killed, we're winning. Mm-hmm. Well, no, you're not. And so supposedly the Brigade Command of 5-2 had body counts. Like hmm. they were keeping, you know, I remember reading that. Wow. Yeah. And I'm not, you know, I do know that there was a lot of, because um, it wasn't only him. It was also the Sergeant Major. Oh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. But Sergeant Major, um, he was like, famous for in Iraq, he had like be an insurgent to death with his, his helmet, his Kevlar, because he's, you know, he's doing his patrol or whatever, weapon jam, scuffle, pistol jam, you're like worst case scenario, right? You're going to use your helmet to, to defend yourself. But yeah, I mean, he had to resort to that. And of course it made him kind of, you know, famous in the, in the combat circle, you know, in the combat world. And so, yeah, it was just, you know, these guys, these, these uh, hardcore infantrymen who, uh, thought they knew the right way to go about getting the mission done and yeah, of but course how, but how you do things in iraq is totally different how you gotta do things in afghanistan yeah and that was a big thing with when we got there like the counter ied lanes they would tell uh you know the instructors which were civilian instructors who i'm sure were you know contractor oh, obviously they're contractors but like uh, you know ex-military who maybe have experience in both um theaters they would, they, I'll never forget. They told us in Iraq, you go fast, you go a hundred miles an hour everywhere and you blow by those IEDs and hope they don't blow you up here in Afghanistan. You go slow. He's like, you go slow here because they will see you coming miles away and you want to go slow because you want to make sure the culvert's clear. You know, you want to make sure that it, you're not going to get blown up and you can't go slow. Like it's, it's kind of counterintuitive, right? Like, how are you going to go mis- get missions done, but go slow? Like, you can't go slow and yeah, you know to an extent right you can but i mean when there's deadlines and when vehicles get hit and you have to respond and like you can't go slow and that's just part of you know and of course there's always um what do you call it it's like the, the kill zones or like the funnels you know the fatal funnels mm-hmm. whether that's the natural terrain or you know things like that and that's how a lot of these vehicles ended up getting you know hit catastrophically was just like these kill zones that 
the, the local locals. And, and five them. two, you are the first striker brigade in Afghanistan too, right? Yeah. Weird. So you already had the spotlight on you, the Taliban in New York coming that oh who who comes this striker brigade, you know? Oh wow, let's you know, and they yeah. probably had a focus on y'all. Let's let's just show them what their technology is mm -hmm. all about. It's, it's nothing here. Yeah, and a big part of why, like, there's a lot of times we couldn't go out on mission because we didn't have any vehicles. All our vehicles were shredded and blown up. Whether that was like you know they were catastrophically destroyed or they just got hit hard enough to no you know maybe nobody died in the vehicle or really got hurt but the vehicle was shredded like all the wheels are blown off and all the undercarriage is torn up because when we went they were flat bottom all the strikers had flat bottom holes so any little bomb we hit you know it just shredded the, the striker and now they're v bottom striker holes so now anytime they get hit underneath you know most of the explosion is kind of like the mraps right because the mraps at the time had that v bottom and so not, not us, man, we were the first ones there. We didn't have, you know, it's funny because um, there's this podcast that it focuses on, you know, Afghanistan and, and Afghanistan veterans. And they're always showing, uh, sharing pictures of themselves and um, multicam walking in line with um, uh, metal detectors. And I'm like, y'all got metal detectors? <laughs> like, we didn't. And then we like, the only people who had metal detectors when we were there were the Air Force guys. And it was always like, it always aggravated me. Like, man, these guys don't patrol like us. Yeah, they came through and, you know, did their job when we'd secure it. But they get out of their vehicle and they have like these, my, these metal detectors were like maybe the size of a shoebox when it was folded. And then they could unfold it to be like the full size metal detector. And so it always drive me a little bit crazy to see like my buddies, you know, my buddies are losing their limbs and their lives out here because we're out here in the grind every day. But these Air Force dudes who don't patrol on our level or the way we do it have these metal detectors. And I'm just like, oh, why can't we get one, you know, or maybe one per platoon or one per company, just something, you know, like, so, and, you know, eventually they did get them right. Cause like I said, it was just kind of weird to see like these infantrymen with metal detectors, like, man, we didn't, we're just out there just getting, you know, while walking through it. And so when did you actually start writing your book? Um, well, technically while well, I was overseas 2009, but you know, actually sit down, you know, four or five hours a night in uh, 2018 when we lost, you know, whenever all that stuff happened with the op-ed and stuff like that. And yeah, you know, I started writing, I was going crazy writing. And I didn't write probably very much, you know, I probably got a lot of my, my grade school stuff out. And then when I got to the military, you know, that self doubt crept in, man, I was like, man, who's going to read a book about me? I'm nobody, right? Like everybody's got trauma, everybody's got issues. So I stopped writing. That's when I filed the patent. And then it was my patent attorney's book that spurred me to go back to writing my book. Because you know, he's got a remarkable story himself. He, um, he actually passed the bar um before he graduated law school like he was just so much about patent law he interned at a at a law firm and he asked them can i please take home your encyclopedias of books so i can just study them at home and they're like oh, we're not supposed to but sure <laughs> and so yeah he was taking home these um these law books and just going crazy studying them and like he just infatuated with patent law and he ended up passing the bar before like he was legally allowed to to practice law before he even graduated law school because he was just so high speed at it, you know, like he just loved it, he just dove into it. And then he talked about just how, you know, he ended up graduating anyways, because it's important, you know, to, to, to network and to get the full scope of the curriculum and see your blind spots and things like that. But then he goes on to um, work at one of the, I can't remember what it was called. It was like, it was the patent, uh, the patent little office or patent house or whatever of like uh, Alexander Graham Bell and like the original, like this hundred plus year old patent place, right? Where these attorneys in this place has been around forever. He got his dream job there, right? And it's a crazy story of how he got the job there. And then, uh, yeah, he just kind of realized like, yo, I, I need to just step out on my own, right? Like I'm, I'm not being as fulfilled as I thought at work. So yeah, and so whenever, you know, he's got a crazy story of how he started his patent, you know, um, his own patent, you know, law firm being a patent attorney. And so at the end of the book, he kind of talks about how we all have to share our story. We all need to share our story because you never know what's going to come of it. Like one example he gives is, you know, there was a, a law, st a law school student who wrote a book about his first year of law school, right? Just for whatever reason, wrote this book about his first year of law school and his experiences. And now that book is like recommended reading at law schools around the country for first year law students. Like, Hey, here, here's this book. You can, ex this is what you can expect more or less. And so another example is like Anne Frank, right. And, and her story or incredible stories, like a lot of, 
a lot of people experienced the Holocaust. A lot of people were, were hiding in attics and a lot of people, you know what I'm saying? Like there was a lot of people experiencing those things, but not everybody wrote them down for it to share. And I'm like, damn, that's like really powerful messages. Like, and that's why whenever I was fact checking my book and going through it and talking to guys I hadn't talked to in 10 years and hearing their stories, I'm like, wow, like I was there when this happened. How did I not know? And wow. Like, all right, so we were all there all at the same time doing the same things, but we all had such vastly different experiences. And I'm like, wow, this is so crazy. And the final reason I tell people to why they should write their own story is because it's very cathartic, you know, like growing up, you know, I raised myself from a young age, parents divorced, and I have an older sister, eight years older than me. And growing up, I always wondered like, man, or, you know, you know, by the time I was like junior high, high school, I was wondering like, why wasn't she there more for me? You know, like she should have been, you know, cause you see these stories of, you know, you know, on TV, like, Hey, 12 year old kid raised their six year old, you know, or their six year old brother or sister. And it's this crazy story, you know, a kid by the time they were 15 had to get a job to take care of a little brother or something, you know? And so I always wonder like, man, why is it, you know, why doesn't my sister do that for me? You know, it was like this weird thing that, you know, I always wondered. And, um, and then I wrote my book and I realized like, damn, she was, whenever my parents divorced, I was six and she was like 12 or you know, 13, maybe 14 at the oldest. I was like, damn, no wonder why she wasn't around. Like she was trying to avoid the, the shitty environment too. You know, I wouldn't have wanted to have been around either. I would have been out with my friends or just away from home. So it was just like writing and seeing the perspective and like putting, you know, like I said, even just going through some military stuff, like in my mind, there was months between certain things. But when I went back and did the work, I was like, wow, these are weeks. And then when I went back in early childhood stuff and thinking about other people's perspectives and how shitty I was to them and, you know, whatever, I'm like, damn, you know, like I need to let go of this stuff because it's, it's unnecessary, you know, like she was a kid and, you know, she didn't want to be around the nonsense too. So, so Ricardo, what was your writing process? Um, well, I started out, you know, cause I didn't know how to write a book. I just started out chronologically from the earliest memories that I could remember to where I wanted to stop writing and finish the story. And um, so, yeah, I just like literally chronological, you know, chronological from the earliest memories to everything I wanted to list. And, um, and yeah, there's a lot of stories that I'm glad I didn't write down. Cause it's like a lot of nonsense from high school, like, you know, just partying and nonsense. That's a good question. Like how do you decide what to include, what not to include? Well, that's going to, you know, I did include some stories of the partying, but like, I mean, there's obviously right high school kids party. So you could write a whole separate book. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like most high school, most people can write a whole different book. I mean, they made a whole movie project about what a high school party, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And so, um, you know, I just realized like, look, I'm not going to spend all this time and effort telling these stories that probably no one's going to want to read. Right. There's nothing substantive. Yeah. There's nothing. Yeah. So I was like, you know what? A few of them are important because of the the close calls that happen. But for the most part, it's all just nonsense. So I thankfully didn't write a lot of, spend a lot of time writing down the nonsense and just push the story along chronologically with what happened with me. And then when I got done writing it all, I had a hundred thousand word journal of my life. And I'm like, damn, like, I I know this is not how books, like you read a memoir and it's never just, I was born, I did this. And I, you know, it's always jumping back and forth. So I'm like, oh, I need to, I need to learn how to format this thing into a book. Like it's a journal right now, but I need to turn it into a book. So I read two books on how to do it. Um, Save the Cat Writes a Novel and The Story Grid. The Story Grid, I highly recommend to anybody because it's such a powerful book to get you to understand um, story and structure and um, conventions and things like that. So it's basically a textbook. It took the author or the author who's an editor 10 years to write and put together. And he uses the silence of the lamb in the book to kind of show you how he died, you know, with his process. So it's, you know, not only are you reading a cool book and learning how to dissect story, you're also kind of getting the story of this, you know, silence of the lambs along with it. So of course, it's a great book. And the reason he says it's such a good book, the story of the lamb, or the silence of the lambs, is because the writer was like a crime journalist. So he was a crime journalist for I mean, over a decade, probably. So he had already like lived in the world of crimes and shittiness, you know? And so, yeah, he just thought like, hey, I've experienced this stuff enough. I think I can, you know, write a, a really gripping story about a serial killer. Psycho and and when, did you bring on, when did you bring on your editor, Anna? And, and I have no idea how to say her last name. When, you, when did Anna come on? Uh, she, you know, I, whenever I was a, 
a grad student at business school, I went to a lot of different departments, um, you know, just popping in and out as kind of the benefit of being a student on campus. You can go to any department and be like, hey, I'm a student. Like, I know I don't ever come here, but hey, I'm a student here, so don't kick me out. And so um, in my mind, I thought like, man, I'm just going to go to the English department and get an editor, right? Because I'd love to have a fellow Husky help me edit this thing. And um, so, yeah, I just went to the English department, walked in uh, and just said, hey, this is who I am. I wrote a book and I'd like to get editorial help from here if possible. Do you have a list of grad students that I can reach out to? And they were like, well, sorry, we used to have a list of grad students, you know, the English grad students. Um, but, you know, that's something they stopped, you know, a couple of years ago, whatever. And she was like, but if you write something and send it to the, the dean or not the dean, but like the director, right, of the English department, if you send it to the director, um, she has the power to send it out to all the grad students. So just make sure it's something, you know, compelling enough to make her want to send it out to all of the grad students. So I wrote down something that I felt was compelling and she thankfully sent it out to all the grad students in the English department. And I got uh, two um, people email me back. One of them was an, a PhD English student uh, who was a former Seattle Times reporter and she had wrote books herself and you know she's a, a very um, uh, accomplished individual. And she, she mostly reached out with recommendations because she was like, yo, I'd love to help you, but I can't right now. I'm a PhD student, you know, blah, blah, blah. But she basically recommended that I, um, that I, um, yeah, kind of find someone else. Cause what would be a good example? Well, I guess Silence of the Lambs is kind of a good example, right? Cause you get like the side of Buffalo Bill and the craziness he's doing, but then you also get the side of Clarice and, and her investigative side. So she basically recommended like, you know, tell your story of what you're experiencing overseas, but also find a reporter who was reporting here in the States and kind of tie those stories together. And I was like, well, because there's a lot of stories that are like that, right? And I was like, oh, that's a, that's a great idea. But, you know, it, that sounds like a lot more work than me just telling my story, you know, because now I got to find someone else and get them wrapped in. And, and so, yeah, and then thankfully, uh, Anna, she messaged me and she was like, hey, this sounds interesting. I'd like to help. And so we met up um, at the hub, the Husky, you know, union building, I think is what it stands for. And yeah, we just met one day over lunch and talked and I told her what I was doing and she agreed to help me. And so like three weeks later, COVID happened and, <laughs> and it really, you know, when COVID happened, I just, obviously the world just flipped upside down for everybody, not knowing the extent of the, the virus and the pandemic. So yeah, so for uh, the first shoot, probably six to eight months, I didn't even message her. I think I might have, like, you know, like I said before with the Navy vet who's helping me with this, like, there's real life world shit going on. Like, I'm not going to worry about like, hey, edit my book, edit my book, you know, like a pandemic's breaking out. So, so yeah. As an editor, there. does she receive a certain percentage of your sales? So how does that work? No, I, uh, there was a couple ways, like when you hire an editor, sometimes they might just charge you a flat rate based on the project or they charge you per word. She charged me a little less than two cents per word. Wait. Yeah, I think a little less than two cents per word. It's like 0 0.017 or something like that. Like a little less than two cents. Per so what does editor actually do? They, like, they, they um, like tell you, hey, you use the word, this word is better. You, you're saying this is the better way to say it. You, instead of saying this in 2,000 words, we can say it in 500 words. Well, what Anna helped me do, like I said, because I wrote the journal hundred thousand word journal. And then I learned how to write a book. So then I realized, like I said, um, it was just a hundred thousand word. Like there was no structure to it. And then I realized what the way I should write it is the first 25% of my book be my grade school story. The middle 50%, like the guts of the book be the military stuff that I always wanted to tell. And then the last 25% of the book, me getting out of the military and going on my academic journey leading up to UW. And so I structured that, right? Like I did that part after this chronological journal mess, I turned it into that. And then I brought it to Anna and I was like, Hey, look, I know this is still not right because it's not a book is never just chronological. It's got to hop around and I need your help. Like I need help. So now, you know, she took it from this chronological thing and, and now it jumps around in time a little bit, right? Like we're tell the story 
and then it jumps so it's almost like flashbacks yeah yeah in a sense you know and then it also a really important thing with her was um thinking about character development right because i'm the character and it's my story so i'm not thinking about like the details and you know uh conveying certain things to the reader and then uh whenever she's reading she's like yo like this is cool that you wrote this but now you need to like delve deep a little more into your psyche of what you were thinking and why and you know blah, like we need some character development here and i'm like oh okay you know like yeah i can easily type a couple sentences explaining whatever so yeah there's a lot of benefits you know of course you know and that's why you know beta readers and alpha readers and you know getting as many eyes on it as you can before it kind of goes public and for me like one of the final things that i did was a grammarly run through where i used the program grammarly which is like this editing software um to go through right one last run through to make sure it's good to go to release it and um there were so many uh really and about i think it was really and about but for sure really so i was like oh i was really you know i was tired you know i was going to go do this and i was really tired or i was doing this and it was really fast you know it was like really like there were so many really so i was like oh my goodness like i'm I, and it was funny because with uh one of my readers who gave me a bunch of feedback and stuff, I just sent him, I sent him a message. I was like, man, I'm really sorry. I made you read that. Really, really, really. I'm really sorry. You know, he's like, what, what why are you telling? I'm like, oh, I just did this edit. And I probably removed easily up 100 to 200 reallys as that final run through. And like I said, it's just, uh, you know, the editor is definitely an important thing because it's important to be your own editor too, which is why I recommend people read that book because ultimately you're the one who knows, right? But it is important to get that outsider perspective. And this was this Anna's first book that she edited? No, she mostly, I think this is her first like, um, I guess like your normal typical, like she, normally she's uh, edited, I know for a fact, she's ed done editing for financial textbooks before. So she's done textbook editing before. And so that's why whenever it looks a little bit different. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So that's why whenever we were first talking about it, she's like, well, you know, this is the extent of my experience, but you know, I can, I can handle it. And I was like, oh, okay. I got complete faith in you. And then it was funny because there was another guy, a, an undergrad who was a part of the, you know, he was a good friend of one of my classmates at UW and, uh, he was in, he was like the lead editor, or the guy in charge of the, the Huskies newspaper there. And he's like, oh, you know, let me be your editor. You know, he don't, I don't think he ever directly told me, but he's like, yo, you know, my, my classmate was like, hey, he wants to really be your editor. Yeah. And I really wanted to hire him. But I felt like not even the fact that he was an undergrad, but just the fact that he's a dude. And like, you know, I wanted a woman's yeah, perspective, you, a you know, because yeah, it's all like out. manly infantry. Yeah. You, you need, know what I'm saying? You need, yeah, you need a woman's perspective. Yeah. That that. Yeah. So I told him, I was like, yo, man, we're going to work on a documentary. And if you want to help with that after, like, that's cool. But I think for the book, like, I need to go with Anna because I, I, you know, and I'm glad I did, you know, because I really feel like having, you know, a feminine kind of perspective and, and touch to it was really, you know, because most readers are females to begin with, yep. you know, so I really, that's why I felt really strongly about, yeah. not only was she a grad student and more experienced, but. Because yeah. who knows how many, you know, mothers of soldiers are going to read this, you know, yeah, you got to take the bro stuff out of it. So let's switch back real fast to the research scientist part you did as we about that. So what kind of diseases, what kind of research do you actually do? Is that COVID, like measles, like, <sighs> and, like what kind do you do research on and how, who decides what you can do research on? Well, I mostly, so what I do now in the evenings, but I'm switching back to days next week. So like tomorrow is basically my last day in the evening in the front of the phone. Well, I'm, I'm lying. So it's like, it's a 24 seven operation. Oh yeah. Seven. Yeah. It's 24 seven. It's, you know, I always call it the labs that never sleep because man, you know, it's a wartime effort there. It's uh, pretty remarkable stuff. And I'm very fortunate, you know, cause there's not a lot of places I can be a scientist at night, you know? So uh, really fortunate to be in this spot where it's open 24 hours and allows me the flexibility and freedom to uh, work my kind of whatever I need to work. And the cool thing about it is even when I got hired, my boss was like, look, your hours are nine to five, but based on experiments, like, you know, you're going to, your hours are going to be a little bit wacky. I was like, oh, okay, cool. So, and are you actually work on the UW, UW campus or somewhere else? No, I work uh, East Lake. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, so right now I work in East Lake and they're opening a new spot in Renton. And so I'll be back and forth uh, okay. working in Renton and here in East Lake. 
And so, yeah, um, we mostly sequence COVID or you know, SARS-CoV-2, the, the novel coronavirus. We mostly uh, sequence that because it's what's paying the contracts, right? The government's like, you know, writing fat checks for universities to do the sequencing work and, and to do this kind of thing to track the stuff down and, and uh, make sure, you know, we're eyes on new variants as they pop up. And so it's mostly, uh, like I said, the novel coronavirus that gets sequenced, but we do sequence other things like herpes and HPV. And um, yeah, I've gotten some weird stuff before. Like, I want to say, what was it? Hamster or something from my ha- Like, I don't know. I'm sure they, you know, it was, um, I'm sure it was like some human born virus. Like maybe it was HPV, but it was like a hamster sample or, oh, fuck okay. I don't want to say it was hamster. And when you say sequence, animal. you mean like genetic sequencing and stuff like that? Or yeah, yeah, like sequencing. Um, so you, can you do like a, a brief 10,000 foot explanation of what exactly, exactly what that is? So you know how, you know, we started with the alpha variant and it went to beta and then the delta variant was very dominant for a long time and it made a lot of people sick. And then the Omicron variant came through, was more mild, but it was very contagious. So the DNA in these viruses are slightly different, right? Because it's basically the same kind of virus, but as they mutate and they exponentially, you know, replicate and mutate, there's going to be small changes in that DNA, right? Because those mutations happen. And so when those small changes happen, it creates a new variant that could make us more sick. It could be, you know, like, you know, like I said earlier, you know, the Delta was getting people more sick, but wasn't as contagious as the Omicron, which is easier, you know, easier to get, but doesn't make you as sick. And so, so they're the same virus, right? They're just different variants. So if you look at the, their, their DNA and snippets, right? So we can choose how many base pairs, because, you know, DNA comes in base pairs, right? We can choose how many base pairs, 20 base pairs, 30 base pairs, it all depends. So we can choose like snippets of the DNA we want to look at. And then, you know, based on the real scientists, that's what I'm saying, like the real scientists with the PhDs figure the shit out and tell us what to do. And then we go through and we, you know, not to say that we don't know what we're doing, but, you know, we go through and we're the grunt workers, right? We're the people that mostly in the lab doing the the ground level stuff. And so, yeah, so they tell us like, hey, this is what you got to do because these are, this is the snippet of the DNA we're going to look at. And then that's what gets kind of turned into a library. So you have this snippet of DNA and you can't just like feed DNA into a sequencer. You have to get it ready, right? For the sequencer to read it. So we put like what's called barcoding or indexes on the ends of the DNA. So it's just like other little chemical crap that we put on the ends of the DNA. So that way, when we feed it into the sequencer, there's a thing in the sequencer that catches it. And in order for it to get caught, it needs those, those index and barcodes or it's, it serves two purposes. It serves to help it get caught on the thing and it helps it get read, right? Cause it's a barcode that the machine needs to read. Right. And that's kind of why they're called barcodes too. And I might be screwing that up a little bit. Cause I know there's like the, oh, what is it called? it's like the index, the index and the barcode, uh, there's like another little primer that gets attached to the end. And then the, after that, it's the barcode, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, like I said, it's been a while since I've worked the, the, the sequencing side of it. It's been a few months, but. So I'm guessing equipment you use is like real powerful equipment, right? Yeah, it's the world's most cutting edge sequencing technology. It's uh, the one, the NovaSeq, the big machine we use, it's a million dollar machine. And every time we run it, like it's such an expensive pipeline. It's one thing that it freaked me out recently because now that I work the front of the pipeline, I'm just basically like getting these plastic plates. And what I do is I get a bunch of tubes, right? With, with COVID positive samples, they're all COVID positive that I deal with. So I put them all in these racks and then a machine, you know, cause these are like the swabs, right? There's like literally swabs still in some of them. And, um, and then the machine takes out the, the fluid and puts it in a plate. And then I put that plate in something else. And then that other something else, that other machine breaks up the cells to release the viral RNA. And then at the end, I get left with a plate of viral RNA that's, you know, from COVID. And then it gets worked on during the day by my, my, you know, my coworkers that are there to create the libraries and feed the sequencers. So this can be a pretty probably ignorant question, but how do y'all not get COVID if you're with COVID all the time? Uh, well, it's all done very safety, like in a biological safety hood or a BSC, um, biological safety cabinet. So basically there's these engineered hoods where you know it's like a glass that we put down 
and then we can stick our arms underneath and work in here. Okay. And there's like, it's, it's created to make a vacuum away from us. Right. So even if we spilt stuff, it would not like the, the, the aerosolization, right? If I were to spill a liquid and it's going to get aerosolized, right? Like some of it, you see the liquid puddle, but what you don't see is some of it gets kicked up into the air. So what happens is when that happens in those hoods, the stuff that gets kicked up and aerosolized, which would make you sick, right? Because the COVID puddle isn't going to get me sick. It's the COVID that got aerosolized and that I'd be breathing in is what would get me sick. So, but in those things, it's all safe and you know, and there's, of course, we wear gloves and there's hand washing stations everywhere. And um, we clean the labs, we bleach everything and ethanol clean everything. It's all very clean and hygienic. So Ricardo, you know, everyone was wearing masks. Do these masks actually work? And of course, you know, if you have like an N95, so some masks that work, but these like cloth masks, like these, do they really work or there's more like cosmetic and make people feel good about having a mask on? Um, how, how effective were they to actually like, stopping people from getting and spreading it i mean i know there's a lot of data and research behind it so i don't want to like speak too specifically i will speak kind of broadly in terms of how i feel about it i you know obviously the mask if it's just like one of the surgical masks like the n95s are obviously better they're a little bit more form-fitting and of course, if you have a beard or anything, it kind of negates uh, masks. Uh, it's almost like the gas mask and that's why we have to be clean shaven, right? So it's almost like that same thing. Uh, but what for the important thing for me, I think is, especially for me working in the labs that we work in, I hope we never go back to not wearing masks because like we're working in a clinical lab where things should be clean and you know, like you're trying not to contaminate your samples. So now, we have a mask over our mouth. So if we're in the lab talking to each other, like when you talk, you're naturally going to spit a little, you know? So we're like working over these plates of important stuff. And if we're talking now, the mask is at least catching our, our aerosolized saliva. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's, uh, I'll never forget when I first got into the entrepreneurship program at UW, uh, one of the people in the program was talking to me. This is before COVID was talking to me, right? As a new student. And they were talking to me. I'm going to use they because I don't even want to identify their gender. And I don't, I want to keep this as generic as possible. They were talking to me. And as they were talking, a little piece of spit flew out coming right for me. Boop, and it landed on me. And I, you know, I just pretend like I didn't see it, you know, because like, it's just one of those things that happens, you know? And, um, and I always, I always find it funny because I made a post on Facebook the other day. I'm like, yeah, have you ever told anybody say it, don't spray it? <laughs> And then like people are like, yeah. And then they came up with like other funny sayings for it or whatever. And I'm always thinking like, wouldn't you have preferred that they've been wearing a mask? So they're not spraying you down with their saliva. Like not even if they're sick or not, just like basic human, don't be spitting on me and stuff, you know? And so that's the way I feel about it. You know, like obviously the, the N95s are going to give you better protection, but at a minimum having these things on are keeping us from spitting on each other and okay. potentially, you know, capacity and, and something and, else and, along and just think of all the things that we did pre-covid we'll never do again right i mean how many times did you go to a chuck and cheese birthday party with a bunch of 10 20 kids yeah and the birthday person blew out the candles spit all the cake right mm -hmm. and everyone ate it right well yeah it was kind of like you know, when my oldest daughter i didn't i i only had one daughter at the time is how young she was we took her to legoland and legoland is literally a bunch of kids just grabbing everything and you know what i'm saying like I just couldn't help but feel like I know she's going to get sick when we leave this place. And sure enough, she got sick. But <laughs> but yeah, it's just like some of those things where I'm sure Legoland does a lot of work now these days, you know, of course. It's and, just amazing how things change. Like, oh, the airplane can be this clean, right? Oh, yeah. you don't have to be <laughs> right. right behind me in line, right? Yeah. Oh, you know, you don't have to like cough out loud on a public place, right? Yeah, and that's just the thing for me. Sense. It's like, now I honestly... I can't stand now that we have the mask mandate lifted here in Washington. I can't stand when I'm talking to people and like they're closer than the six feet or whatever. That doesn't yeah. bother me. What bothers me is I can feel their breath. Like yeah. I can feel them breathing on me. And I'm like, yo, you're a little bit too close to me. Yeah. You know, like, and when I was in Texas in December, we went to a, like a bar and grill place for lunch while I was, you know, I met up with some friends for lunch and um, I'm standing in the line and there's a guy behind me, like standing behind me. And he's like literally right here. Like I could probably like if he was right behind me right here, I go right there and I'd smack him in the face. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking like, hey, can I get some? Like, there's plenty of room in the line. It's like like a crowded place. You know what I'm saying? Like we had room, and this guy just wanted to crowd me. And I'm like, man, this is weird. Like, 
you know, the whole pandemic, they've been like six feet, six feet. And this dude's giving me like six inches, you know, yeah. <laughs> like I understand like whatever that didn't bother me, but what just bothered me was like, he was in my space, you know, like not even the COVID stuff, but like, damn, you would think at this point, you'd understand, like give people a little bit of space at this point. So you know? what's the future of COVID? Are we gonna have to deal with like variants every six months for the rest of our lives? Um, like, very degrees well, or... it, it really comes down to, I think, you know, early on, I'm going to, I don't, early on, I felt like when this first happened, I felt like we probably aren't going to get out of this till like 2024, 2025, because human nature, we, when things go wrong, we try to go fast. And then like, there's always an accordion effect. And that's basically what's been happening, right? We have our, you know, our, um, our different waves of COVID have been happening, right? So they're basically like these, this accordion effect. And so, yeah, I always, you know, figure that we're never going to, it's like driving in traffic, right? Like it's hard to stay at the same speed and keep the same pace with each other. So there's always going to be like these effects that the logistical effects, like the logistics with all the shipping in the world with COVID, right? Like everything got shut down. So there is more, you know, supply than demand because, or depending on what this stuff was, but so, yeah, it's just like these things. And yeah, it just. We're going to be in it for a while. And there's two things I want to say about this topic as well. So a long time ago, are, are you familiar with Elizabeth Holmes? The <laughs> Theranos? Yeah. yeah, a lot of people. Yeah, the golden girl who failed everyone, who so scammed everyone. It, what drives me crazy about that, and oh, I, I wish I was a, I, I also learned that I'm one of the OG YouTubers. Like, as I just, I was uploading videos on YouTube in like 2007, my army stuff. And YouTube was like a year too old. And I didn't even realize what I was doing, but I I wish I could go back and take better care of that channel and whatever. And there is always, I'll regret never making this video. Whenever Elizabeth Holmes was like hot shit in the news everywhere for creating this, you know, incredible technology that nobody else. And she dropped out of college and like all this crazy shit. I, me as an undergraduate going to school for chemistry and engineering, I, I smelt bullshit from 2000 miles away in Texas, man. I was like, there's no way, there's no way that this young woman with all the remarkable scientists in the world, right? Not even in the US, right? Like creating this blood, one drop of blood testing technology. I, I couldn't believe it. And there was like nothing. In the fact her board of directors had no, si war, had no yeah. science on. Mm -hmm. They like forced our war generals. Yeah, yeah. So not even just that, you know, of course that was before she got um, Mattis on her board and all these guys. Like it just never, it never sat right with me. It never, and I was like, like I said, it just didn't make sense, right? Like you have all these great scientists all over the world, but yet this girl who did two years at Stanford or less dropped out and, you know, like panted this great stuff or whatever. Like it just never, it never seemed right to me. And sure enough, it was never right. Yep. So and so I source it as the Philippines and the Walgreens. And so I'm probably not going to make a lot of friends with this. I don't know, I'll probably explain this, but I feel the same way about the, COVID-19 inventor or the uh, mRNA vaccine inventor uh, that old, I don't even know what his name is. He's a, a doctor or whatever, right? He's a PhD scientist. He calls himself the mRNA inventor, vaccine inventor, because he did the original research in like the 80s or something, right? Like he was one of the first people to recognize that this messenger RNA could potentially be used one day in the far future to create a cure for something. So, so yeah, I'm not saying he's not a scientist. I'm not saying he's not smart, but I, the way I feel about it, it, that's like saying the Wright brothers invented the Falcon nine. You know what I'm saying? Like, just because you were the pioneers in aerodynamics doesn't mean you were the inventor of the Boeing 747. You know what I'm saying? Like, so to go on that stretch of, Hey, I had patents on MRNA stuff in the eighties to be like, yo, I invented this vaccine technology is I feel like that's kind of a stretch. So like I said, you know, I have and what really made me shady about this was one of my buddies from the army, he sent me a video with this guy and also um, uh, the Olympic College guy, he's like, uh, he's Feinstein, 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 or something like that. Weinstein, Weinstein. He's a, he's the guy who got famous for Olympic college for like standing up to the woke kids. And do you remember any of no, that? That was, yeah, that happened here in Washington. He went on the Joe Rogan podcast and that's obviously what made him famous, but, um, but yeah, so Joe Rogan basically invited him on. Cause this guy was going, this professor was going viral 
for standing up to these woke kids and you know because they were just trying to get them to I, I don't know it was like stupid oh, lizard brain college kid stuff you know it was like this stupid stuff they were trying to provoke them to say something racist or to do something you know like that to, to just make him point out his um privilege of being a white male or you know like something stupid you know and he like stood up for himself and it went viral on the internet and rogan invited him to his podcast and it turns out guy's a brilliant guy he's a really smart scientist and a smart guy but what bothered me was like you know this guy created the podcast had this mrna vaccine inventor on and they're talking about data and they're like oh well look at this data and you know this is why you should be, you know, cautious about the vaccine or whatever the, the thing was. And so they're like, look at the data, look at the data, look at the data. I'm like, okay, I want to look at the data. So I go to the link, right? There's they're like, oh, if you want to see the data, click on the link, you know, in the description. So I clicked it, go to their website, which is a blog. And if you want to see the data, you have to pay. Oh. And I'm just like, oh, like not a this, good look. Yeah. I was saying like, cause the way I think about it is the data that they got, this data was more than likely publicly sourced data from government research or university research. But at the end of the day, it was publicly available data that you are claiming you saw, but yet you're telling me you, you, you know, you, um, starts with the C, you know, you, uh, you got it all ready for me. I can't think of the word right now. You, you got it all ready for me to look at but now you want to pay me to see it or you want me to pay to see it. And so like right there, you're like, you're telling us you want to see the data. You're telling us you care about the public. You're telling us not to take the vaccine. You're telling us, look at the data, but you want to make us pay to see the data. Like, no, it's, it's weird, man. It's weird. And so it kind of bothered me. And I lost a little bit of respect for that other guy. Cause he seemed like a, a real straight shooter, you know, and then to have that guy on his podcast and then be like that. And then be like, yeah, look at the data, but you got to pay for it on this guy's blog, you know? And it's like, oh, kind of cringe, you know? So Ricardo, let's go back like uh, the first day that COVID came out. Everyone, the COVID became like a, a pandemic. So how how were this? So COVID <clears> just <throat> comes out. All these you know the war is going to end. All this stuff, right? Did the COVID end being like not as bad as worse? The same? Did we get off easily? Or did we get lucky? Or did it end, end up like the, the experts thought it was going to end up? Yeah, I mean. I think we got pretty lucky or, you know, I, I definitely got lucky in my own personal world because, you know, obviously the, the pandemic, there's a really interesting, interesting thing I, I heard recently was we're now getting to the point in America of about a million people who have died from COVID. <clears throat> and so they're like, there's, there's 300, we'll just say 320 million people in the U S 1 million have died from COVID. Even if you go that times five, so like let's say the person that died, the closest, the five people closest to them that were impacted, their husband, their wife, their mother, their father, their, you know, their siblings, their kids or whatever. The five closest people that were affected by those 1 million deaths, that only puts us at 5 million people who were strongly affected, affected by COVID. And yeah, a lot of people got sick and, you know, maybe were hospitalized for a little bit or whatever. But there are a million people who died and, at, you know, as a quick, you know, um, estimate, 5 million people who were really torn by the virus. But that's still a small fraction of the 320 million people in the U.S. Yeah. And that's why you get a lot of that. Let's just take the masks off. Let's roll back stuff. You know what I'm saying? Because most people were not directly impacted by the virus. And I'm like, damn, I never thought about it like yeah. that. You know, that's kind I mean, of, a, really puts it in perspective. Based on stats, like very low percentage. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It puts it in real perspective. And so that's why it's, you know, that's why I'm saying I got lucky because the COVID was a blessing for me. You know, it's kind of sad to say, because I was commuting five to six hours a day to go to school at, at UW. And that was just soul draining for me, you know, the commute alone. And so when the pandemic hit, it killed my commute. And I was like, Oh, thank you. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, I'm spending 25 hours a week just driving to and from school. I'm spending a day a week, you know, just driving to and from school. So I was thankful for that. And then, of course, you know, um, we started getting stimulus checks, right? A lot of people got stimulus checks and we got stimulus checks. And because of the situation we were in, we used those checks to pay my wife's tuition for her master's degree. And so, you know, for us, it was more of a blessing than a curse because no one, you know, I don't have anybody in my life that lost their lives directly. You know, I do know of people that have loved ones that they lost, but no one was directly affected in my life. And so it was more, you know, more benefit than detriment. And it's 
a big reason of why I feel I'm a scientist today, because I feel without COVID and the need for more scientists and lab techs and nurses and doctors that I'd still be sweeping floors somewhere for you, not for the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, it's, I'd be bad to say, but COVID definitely was a blessing for a lot of people, right? I mean, COVID definitely did a lot of people. And then it's about entrepreneurship, right? Of course, this is my opinion. So a lot of businesses went out of business because of COVID, right? My theory is like, these businesses would have run out of business anywhere, right? It might have taken five, 10 years to go out of business. COVID has like amped up yeah. the, the process, mm-hmm. right? Of them going out of business. Like, so your business has bad customer service. Well, it, it's, it, it's just like a highlighter, right? I know so many, especially restaurants, I know so many restaurants like did like out of the box thinking, you know, deliveries, you know, yeah. come to your, I mean, there's so many people like had great ideas and they're still business and, and thriving business, right? Mm-hmm. So many other business like, oh, I just think that they would have got that business anyway. Yeah, you know, it's a beautiful thing about, and that's, you know, the double edged sword of entrepreneurship is you have freedoms to, set, you know, that was a kind of a big eye opening thing about business school was like learning that you can set up a business and make it however you want. If you want your employees to wear pink shirts and striped, you know, black and white referee pants, that can be the uniform if you want it to be yeah. like, you literally get to choose everything. You know, of course, it's got to be within the laws and, and legal and, not trying to, you know, um, you know, uh, minimize those who work, you know, in your office or whatever, but, but yeah, it was kind of this eye opening thing. And the beautiful thing about it is, you know, you always hear about your personal finances or like, Hey, you know, with your personal finances, you should have at least like six months of, of your household covered, right? Like if, you know, someone passes away, can't work anymore, or someone gets hurt or something. Like what, what fantasy land are you living in? Yeah, well, that's a tough thing to do, no doubt, man. It's taken me, you know, I've got to the point now where I can maybe manage, you know, for at most six yeah. months, but it's taken me many years to get to that point, you know, so I very, but the beautiful thing about that is it, you know, allows flexibility. So when my wife has, you know, drama at work, I'm like, don't stress at work, just quit. I'm like, yeah. we, we can float ourselves if need be, so just quit. But I say that because it's an important thing to do in our personal lives, but especially if you're a business owner, if you're a business owner, you need to try to have at least a year's worth of, of cash flow or, you know, like money saved up because you never know when COVID's going to happen. You never know when the economy is going to take a dump. You never know when you're going to lose half your customer base. You never know X, Y, Z, you know, so. You know, some random car DUI person might brand the car into your, to your place of business. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, um, I think that was what was really a big business killer was. A lot of people live in their personal lives, paycheck to paycheck. So, you know, a lot of these business owners run their businesses paycheck to paycheck. And so when those paychecks got cut off, you know, or whenever COVID hit and the economy got, you know, slammed and everything closed down, they didn't have their runway, you know, maybe they could survive. And that was a sad thing was, is they didn't need a year of runway. They just needed, you know, six months. And then the government stepped in and started pumping money out for businesses. So that's why it's important to just have, you know, to start, you know, I, I think that's a big mistake a lot of founders make is, you know, that extra, you know, the the extra revenue, they start to pocket it, or, you know, they don't, you know, they buy bigger, better equipment when they don't necessarily need it right away, you know, or they'd start to put more overhead on the plate. And then, you know, it's like kind of like one of my uh, experiences in my family. Um, before the 2008 recession, you know, um, one of the people in my family had a lot of property, you know, businesses and stuff. And then the economy crashed and he had way too much overhead and lost it all, you know, because he wasn't able to generate the revenue to cover all that overhead. And Uncle Sam came knocking for everything, you know? Yeah. So Ricardo, talk about ethics and genetics. Example, I'll use example. And I'm pretty sure this happened. But I guess somewhere in China, the scientists did some genetic engineering where this child would never get HIV. And of course, that's a good thing. But the other thing, like, that he just did on his own. He didn't ask the parents' permission. Of course, I was not the kid's permission. Like, talk about genetics, ethics, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I, uh, I had an interesting conversation with somebody about this the other day because he was trying to argue that there shouldn't be any ethics in science or something like that. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, what? Um, yeah, it was a weird conversation. But, <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely important, you know, because you know, it's the reason why we test on animals first, right? Or like, we try to avoid animal models if we can, right? It's like, at some point, you do have to test on mice and other animals to make sure it's safe for humans. But that's the ethical part. Like, you know, some people might say, well, it's unethical to do those to, that do that to animals. And yeah, I agree to that to an extent. But 
it's also at the end of the day, it's an important part of the reason why we're able to live to be over a hundred years old. You know, like it's an important part to the longevity of us and, and our understanding and, um, and not to say that, you know, like I said, that there are mistreatment of animals and things like that, that go on. Cause there's always those things that happen. There's always going to be bad actors. It's, I'll never forget, um, you know, part of the, the craziness of the book is me trying out for special forces and that shit was crazy, but I'll never forget, man. Some of the most powerful words ever spoken to me in the military happened at special forces selection and assessment SFAS. And, um, so when you first get there, you know, they're giving you the briefs and one of the cadre briefed us and he said, you know what, guys, I want y'all to remember this. He goes, no matter how many gates are in place, shit bags always get through. And I was just like, damn. So he's basically letting us know, like, obviously there's a lot of gates in place to earn that green beret, but no matter how many gates are in place, shit bags still get through. And I'm just like, damn, <laughs> like that's deep. You know, we are, we're over here trying to get away from the shit bags, you know, and now you're telling me that I'm going to go through all this shit and still have to deal with shit bags, you know, like it's kind of disappointing, but yeah, I've just kind of carried that on everywhere. Like no matter no matter the industry, no matter the, you know what I'm saying? Like there's going to be bad actors and there's going to be people who don't want the best in or who, you know, who uh, try to pocket, you know, whatever for them and care about themselves at the end of the day. But, or, or just like, you know, there's always a last, there's always the last in the class, right? Yeah. So you're, you're flying, you know, an airlines, you know, you don't know that guy flying might've been the last in his class, right? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's just, um, we're on the ethics and genetic side of it, the way I think about it is, uh, are you familiar with CRISPR, the genetic engineer? Yeah. I think we talked about that a little bit before when we hang out, but, um, so there's that Chinese scientist who used CRISPR to engineer these twin girls. Have you heard about this? Yeah. To be resistant to AIDS. Yeah. That's what that was, I was talking about. Yeah. 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 So that, that's it. Yeah. yeah. That's the story. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I mean, doing that, like trying to, protect humans from AIDS from being able to con contract AIDS is a honorable, remarkable thing to do. But he went rogue and did it on his own, like without peer review, without making sure, you know, cause we all need to, we're, we all have our blind spots, you know, and that's the important thing about, um, recognizing that and, as and a scientist. And why those twins, like, you know, why they get so like, why not someone else and how does that, you know? yeah, you know, so it's crazy, you know, cause they're, these poor girls are going to be like, basically lab animals for their life. You know, I'm sure they're going to try to, well, I mean, it's, you know, China, but who knows what the extent that they're going to take it to. But I mean, basically they're just going to keep these girls under a microscope and a fine tooth comb mm -hmm. to see ultimately what he did and what actually ends up happening, mm -hmm. you know? So it's a, you know, I've actually listened to the audiobook of the, it's called the code breakers. And it's about Jennifer Dowden, who won the Nobel prize for the technology. And it's a beautiful book because it talks about all the players and everybody involved with it, not just her, you know, everyone else, all the other university studies and her path and whatnot. And um, it's just interesting to hear them talk about how they can use it to delete human depression. Like, because we have identified the gene that makes us depressed. So we could literally use CRISPR to go and cut that gene out and never get depressed again but they talk about the implications of humans that never get depressed. Right? So mm -hmm. it, it's an important thing for us to get sad. And, you know, I'm have you ever watched the show called your million it comes on Nat Geo? You're, you're a million. No, you're Y E A R million. Your million. It talks about oh. humans, like in the future, like a long time, like in the future, yeah, no. it talks about that kind of the depression and, and the implication, like, you know, people are depressed, like, you know, you know, the value they add, you know, the, the resilience, you know, you cut all that out, you know, and it's really a good thing. Yeah. I mean, and, and on the other side of the coin, I've read that it's going to be a critical tool in making us a space traveling species because now we can engineer ourselves to be more resistant to the UV of space. And like now we can engineer ourselves for our bodies to process the crap food, like all the processed food and fast food and stuff. We can engineer our bodies to make it like nutrition. You know what I'm saying? To take it on like it was nutrition. And so, of course, it's going to take years and billions of dollars to make this kind of stuff happen. But it's literally a tool now. It's like the most powerful. It's, like, it's a whole new revolution. It's like a big part of the book. Like we had the, you know, the, you know, 
like the iron age, you know, whatever, whatever, and the industrial revolution, the technological revolution. And now we have the CRISPR revolution and it's really going to change the future. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah. One of the things, when the episode is talking about the, your, the, your million show is talking about one of the predictions in the future, you're going to inject like nano stuff into your body and these nano robots, you're going to call it, are going to go to your cells. And I, and okay, I'm, you're about to code, get a code. The, that nano robot is going to know a code's coming on. It's going to destroy it. Or you have codes coming on. It's going to be, predisposed to predict virus or whatever coming into and they're like knock it out so to speak you know mm-hmm. and that kind of reminds me of because that's the problem with medicine today is it's not very pres- like you know you you take medicine and it basically goes courses through your whole body right it's very hard to get like point specialized medicine delivered to an area and they talked about how oh it was that guy one of those guys from that podcast i was talking about earlier they talked about how how they were able to give shots now and get like the direct relief or I don't know. It was kind of weird talking about the COVID or shot or something. And I thought it was really weird because they were just talking about how very broadly they're like, well, we, you know, you know, if you inject something that that's where the medicine goes. And I was like, what? No, that's not how it works. Like, you know, even if you inject something, it's still going to get coarse. You know, it might say localized at the start, but eventually your body's, you know, it's going to break it's down. Travel everywhere. Yeah. So it was kind of like this weird thing that they were speaking like it was factual. And I was like, what? That's not true. Like, it's very, that's like one of the biggest problems in medicine these days they're trying to solve is getting localized medicine to areas because everything is just kind of like the anti-venom, right? Like you can get here, but here, and you're going to get anti-venom, but the anti-venom is going to course through your whole body. And it's, you know, eventually you're going to need enough to start working in this area. So yeah, it was just kind of these things where, you know, and that's what I'm saying, you know, the ethics of it and, um, there's going to be bad actors, man. There's just, you know, there's bad scientists, there's bad businessmen, there's bad soldiers, there's bad, you know. Is there some kind of like worldwide science organization that oversees all this or does each country pretty much do their own thing? Um, no, there are. Um, the scientific community, you know, obviously it needs to be all peer reviewed, peer, peer reviewable science. So there are standards and organizations depending on what you're kind of, so like right now, because data and data, data analytics is a big, you know, thing for all these AI platforms and stuff. I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but there is a, it's like a European and US, I don't know if there's more countries that are involved with it, but it's kind of like a, um, because obviously with data and putting it in a machine to give you results, you can, you can feed the machine data and program it to give you what you want. You know what I'm saying? So you can make it seem like, hey, if I put in patient data X Y Z and I get out this result, um, my my technology works, right? Put in patient data, get out X Y Z result. Well, then these data scientists will go in and see exactly the data. So what they do is they created a standard of transparency and ways of like how this data needs to be set up, so that way everybody can look in and make sure like it's not being manipulated. So there are, like I said, uh, organizations that, that are trying to, and like one thing that is uh, an easy example is the standards of weight and measurement. Cause so like, you know, there's a, there are standards, like there are conventions for scientists, like, Hey, gravity is 9.8 meters per second square. You're like these conventions, right. And scientists every so often you know, test them with our better technologies, we get more digits on these numbers kinds of things. So they're always working to, you know, make things more uh, even, like, even is not the right word, but more um, transparent and, you know, on the same field, on the same playing field and making sure everybody's understands their same things and everybody under, you know, underneath the same kind of umbrella understands that these are the way that we're trying to get stuff done. So Ricardo, you just did an interview for your PhD, right? Yeah. Can you talk about that process? Why a PhD? And I, what's your what's your vision for yourself as a as a scientist? Like, what's your goal as far as that? Well, that's a whole another crazy story, too, man. My life is so full, full circle. I mean, like, it's so crazy how this is all playing out. So yeah, I did. Um, I applied for PhD programs. Most of the deadlines were December first of last year, and um, I applied for five programs at UW and two programs in Texas. All the programs at UW rejected me, and I got to interview for one 
program in Texas last week, the PhD in human genetics program at uh, University of Texas, uh, Rio Grande Valley. And it's a brand new program, good opportunity, whatever. And uh, so, yeah, you know, it was a, a kind of painful, long process. And a lot of the UW programs rejected me pretty quick within the first two or three weeks. I think three of the five had rejected me. And so uh, two of their programs, you know, over the last, you know, six weeks or so rejected me. Do they tell you why they reject you? Mm, they very broadly tell you, they're like, hey, you know, thanks. It was very competitive, but. The funny one for me was genome science, my rejection from genome science, because it was literally just like, yo, like it almost the way they worded it was just like, we, we just want like groomed academics here was the way it was. Cause it was like, Hey, thanks for applying. A lot of our applicants have a ton of research under their belt. And they're also, how did she, they word it? It was like, they're, they're also very academically prepared or something like that <laughs> like like basically these kids or these students i should say these students don't have any gaps in their academic career you know like graduated top 10 of their class went to college got their degrees went to masters got their masters and now you know straight into phd so maybe like 24 year 22 24 year old students into these programs and so, uh, yeah, so that's, like I said, you know, that's what they made it sound like a very academically prepared. So they may just made it sound like, Hey, there were these kids had, it. and the one hope I did have for one of their programs was a program where they're on their student profile. Some of their students were talking about, yeah, I went backpacking for a year and yeah, I took a little break. So that was a program that was the last one to reject me. Basically it was like my last hope. I was like, Oh, if anything, this will be the one program that I will get an interview for, for UW, but I didn't even get to interview for that one. But, and so it was funny. Because when I did the interview for RG, you know, for the genetics program in Texas, at the very beginning of the interview, they asked me, um, or they told me, hey, thanks for doing this, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I said, no, thank you for letting me do the interview because the struggle of any PhD student is you apply to a bunch of programs in the hopes to get to this point to do the interview. So thank you. So I do the interview. It's going great. And then the guy leading the interview kind of tosses it up and he asks you know, everybody who, you know, lets them know, ask, ask him questions. It's a free time. And so one of the first questions I get asked is, well, at the beginning of the interview, you said you applied to other programs. How do we fall in that mix? And I'm just like, oh man, <laughs> like you're literally asking me like how I rank you of, with the other programs. Right. And I was like, well, I applied to five programs at UW because it's right up the road for me and two in Texas based on the recommendation from this other scientist. So I hold you in high regard because I only applied to two programs in Texas based on the recommendation of this other scientist. And so, yeah, you know, it got crazier from there. And uh, yeah, so I feel like I got a really good chance of, of getting, you know, maybe not this year, ideally this year, um, but if not, hopefully, because it's a brand new program. They're allowing seven students per year for the first four years until they get to a steady state of about 25 students graduating per year. So yeah, it's only seven spots available and so to be one of the first seven would be really lucky and i you know I, I feel like i've got a good shot because of in you know at the end of the interview they asked do i have anything else i want to say and i said um i you know I, i'm glad i'm being considered as being one of the first students in this program because if i'm selected i would love to go in there and get it prepared and help like take the punches and and get it ready for the students after me right because i'll be one of the first seven so I'd be honored to help, you know, it's not going to be perfect, right? Especially as a new program is we're going to have our bumps and our hiccups and stuff like that. So I told him, I was like, look, I'm not expecting perfection from a new program. So I'd be happy to be one of the first students to help take, you know, to ride along on this bumpy ride. And then the guy leading, it was like, oh, no, that's great. Cause you know, we understand that too. And, you know, for them, they really want students who are going to He's like, this is what he said. He's like, we need self-motivated students. We need people who we know are, we're going to put in and give these good opportunities to, and they're going to finish because they're a brand new program. So if they put students in and they don't finish, they're going to get their funding cut. But if they put new students in and they're graduating a bunch of them, then they're going to get more funding. So he's like, man, it's very important at this stage. It's a brand new program. We need students who are self-motivated and are going to finish. And I'm just like, oh, no, yeah, yeah I'll finish it. <laughs> you know, I'll I'll definitely get it done. And so I just feel like in my life, man, it's been a, a combination. It's like entrepreneurship, right? It's uh, luck and timing, you know? So I got lucky that I ended up at, as a research scientist of virology. I've been there a year, got the experience I needed, and now I'm getting lucky 
the timing of a brand new program in Texas getting started and, and them really wanting people who they know they, they can count on to, to finish. So what do you see yourself as the future? Like you're going to be like, do you want to like read, lead some type of high visibility research lab at Harvard or, or like, what's your goal for there? Like what's your, yeah, I mean, um, my goal has always been, um, and this is where the weird full circle part comes around. Cause the, when I graduated in 2016, right before I graduated, I met this guy. I might've shared this story the last time. I don't remember, but, um, but basically I met this uh, long story short. I met this other scientist and it was really weird when I first met, when I, my eyes first laid, eyed, first laid eyes on him, I was like, damn, I know you from somewhere. This is really weird. But I was like, it was that I know you from somewhere feeling times 10,000, right? That's the only, only way I can describe it. Cause I've had that feeling before, but this is not that feeling. That's the only way I can describe it. And so I was like, man, I had this weird feeling. Well, later in the day, he's like, Hey, I'm going to give a talk about how I grew up poor, single mom, blah, blah, blah. And ended up at Harvard. Cause he was a researcher at Harvard at the time. Um, just visiting the, my university. And so he's like, man, I'm going to give this talk later in the day. I'd appreciate it if I came to my talk. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. I'm going to go to his talk. And when he's done, I'm just going to approach him, ask him for his email. And then I'm going to send him an email asking him, Hey, do I know you from somewhere? I had this weird feeling. So I went to the talk and when it was done, I went up and I approached him. And before I could even say anything, he goes, Hey man, do you have an older brother or something? I feel like I know you from somewhere. And my mind melted because like I had that feeling of I know you from somewhere, but he reciprocated it to me before I could even say anything. And so, yeah, man, I just uh, I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, like it was such a powerful feeling that he felt it, too. And uh, and so, yeah, I was like, no, I don't have an older brother. We talked a little bit and there's like no connection. So it was really weird. And ever since then, you know, he's my co-founder of the biotech startup now. So we've been you know connected ever since then. And now he's in Texas doing research at Texas A&M Kingsville. And he's been telling me, he's like, Hey, university of Texas is trying to poach me. They're trying to make me an offer, you know, to pull me away from Texas A&M. And uh, I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. So after the interview, I text him. I'm like, Hey, interview went great. You know, blah, blah. He's like, Hey, do you have time for a call? I was like, yeah, sure. So I called him and we're talking. He's like, you know, I told him about the interview and how well it went. He's like, Oh, that's cool. And I thought about it and I was like, wait a minute, how's your offer going? Because the University of Texas is supposed to make you an offer, right? And he's like, how's your offer? He's like, oh, well, they're still putting the packet together for my offer. And then when he said that, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I was like, so if if they make you an offer to be a professor at University of Texas, are you going to be a professor in this human genetics program? And he's like, yeah, man, yeah. I was like, what? Like, no way. Because like, when I first met him, talk about stuff lining it up. Yeah, that's all I wanted when I first met him. I was like, man, I don't know you. I don't know what you do, but just this weird feeling that I had. All I know is I want you to put me under your wing, and I just want to learn from you. And now here we are. You know, oh my goodness, what is this? Uh, six, four, six years later, man. Full circle. Six years later, he's gonna more than likely end up there, and hopefully, me too. So. Well, if he gets hired, I'm sure he's going to have a big influence on who gets accepted. Well, yeah, and that was the cool thing, you know, during the interview is I'm talking to when these other professors are introducing themselves, talking to me about the research they do. One of the professors was like, yeah, I use CRISPR to genetically engineer possums. I think it was possums. I use CRISPR to genetically engineer possums to be resistant to Zika virus. And I was like, whoa, that's kind of crazy. And then he's like, and then I also work with, uh, you know, Jacob Galan with snake venom. So like my co-founder, he's like, I also work with this scientist on snake venom stuff. And I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. And so like he name dropped him. And that's why I was like, later, I was like, Oh, you know, I know Jacob too, you know, just because like, he wrote a letter of recommendation for me for the program. And so, uh, so yeah, it's just kind of crazy how I kind of was like, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like they're trying to hire you, but are they going to hire you for this program in the yeah. Valley? And it's like, yeah, man, that's, I'm going to be there. Wow. It's kind of weird, you know, like six years later to, for it to all come back down to this and me ultimately getting what I wanted, you know, and it was kind of funny because in 2016, when I met him, he was at Harvard and I literally left after I graduated not long after. And after like within a year of me moving up, he moved back down from Harvard to Texas where I was. And I was like, man, in my mind, I never thought you were going to move back to Texas. Like I thought you were going to be a Harvard, uh, you know, working there forever, you know, but now he's, uh, he loves snake venom, you know, like that's his, his, where he started. But that's the cool thing about it was like, he started doing snake venom research, got his PhD in biochemistry, and then did postdoc work in Canada learning about cancer. And then that's how he got the job as a, a research fellow at Massachusetts General Hospital for Harvard doing more cancer stuff. 
And then after three or four years there at Harvard, he's like, eh, back to Venom. So he moved down to Texas and went back to Venom. And now he's going to end up back in the Valley doing human genetics, you know, being your professor, cancer being stuff. Your yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Can you talk about this? I think a lot of people don't get this part right. Or how like you might take this one small step, you know, like for you, you took the temp job, right? But what you don't see, you take this small temp job. And then what, t- uh, 10 years later, you're competing to be a PhD, right? Yeah. I think people, you know, they don't realize the steps of process to go through, right? It's mm-hmm. like, it isn't, it, nothing's overnight, right? I'm covering you just not overnight. Some people forget the steps, the journey, you know, like, like I like to say, like Apple didn't come out for eight years, right? Yeah. That's a, an interesting thing about like uh, the, how I built this podcast, you know, is it's a podcast about, you know, like major businesses and how they got started. And like, I always feel like most businesses have been, started from 2000 and after you know other than like coke ford and like the the harley davidson and like these businesses that we know just like growing up have been around forever but i felt like most businesses have only been around for 20 30 years but then you go to listen to these podcasts and you dive into the business world and like no these businesses have been around for 50 plus years you just took them a long time to get to where they you know what i'm saying like it takes a very very long time and so yeah it's um it's human nature, man. I think it's human nature. We all, especially these days where it's a results driven, click it now, get me what I want now kind of thing, you know, so to do anything worthwhile, it, it takes a lot of hard work and time. And um, yeah, you know, it's, just, you know, all this instant self gratification stuff. And then believe me, I feel like that all the time too. It's like, man, I wish I could just like make things happen faster. I was like, why doesn't things happen faster? You know, but it's just uh, the day-to-day grind that you have to just keep pushing forward and eventually things. And that's kind of funny for me, you know, it's, I've been working on this book for years and this phone case stuff for years. And I'm literally, you know, the book's out on Amazon now. So like that journey's done other than me promoting it and working on the documentary and audio books and all the other parts of that go along with it. But like for the bulk of it, the journey's done. And for the same thing for my patent, you know, I've been awarded the utility patent um i found somebody who can help me get this done we just have our small hiccups right now we're, we're pretty much right there so it's kind of weird that these things that i've been pushing for years and years and years and waiting and hoping and waiting and hoping for them to like start generating revenue because it has been money sucks for years you know and it's not even about the revenue it's just like i just want to start getting like i've been pushing it forward so much i would like to get something you know starting to come back in return you know whether that's monetary or just hanging out with you doing your podcast or doing whatever you know it's like man i've been grinding for years at this stuff and i'd like to start reaping a little bit of the reward you know whether that be you know i definitely don't want any fame so just buy my stuff and you know throw my picture away or something i don't know so let's go back to the book so i have no idea how the book process works but it seems like you combine writing a book with startup methodology. Like, it's like you'd use the MVP model, right? Because you, you release an alpha version of your book, the beta version. So I have no idea if that's what it has actually done or are you, are you kind of combine. Did you combine like startup stuff and MVP stuff with writing the book, publishing the book? Yeah, I mean, um, that's basically, excuse me, that's basically um, their recommendations as a self publisher is get it done as cheap as fast as possible. That's a big thing with uh, Renee Bob. You know, she's like, 90 days or less, you can pump your book out. And you really can, you know, um, depending on the the content of the book and and whatnot. But it's um, it's just been this kind of yeah. I don't I don't know. It's kind of hard to describe. You know, it was like I said. You know, there's lots of resources online. Like Reddit was such a super powerful resource because you know the self publishing subreddit and all the subreddits for all the things you're interested in. You can learn. And it was really cool because I'm like, I'm doing all this research, learning about how these people sell hundreds of thousands of books and do these crazy things. And I'm like, man, it's, it sounds like it's a hard thing to do. You know, like you're reading about it and they talk about oh, it's not that hard. You just got to do this. And I've sold 20,000 books in a month or something. And then I meet Renee Bob, the self-publishing lady. And um, she literally is describing to me how she implements the things that I read online and was like, that sounds doable, but how, you know? And so to meet Renee and, and have her as my book mentor, man, like bunker labs, thank you, bunker labs, <laughs> you know, like for of, of all the things at a minimum, bunker labs is such a great organization, but just of course, networking with other entrepreneurs. And because that was always my biggest worry, man. Like 
the phone case stuff was always a hassle, but I was like, I have this book and I don't know what to do. Like, yeah, I'm doing all the research online, but it'd be really great to have somebody bring me under their wing and kind of show me the ropes. And, and then that the first, like, I don't know if it was the first or second meeting when Renee Bob had actually joined us and she was like, Hey, I do book publishing. This is, I'm like, what? Like, this is perfect. And so, yeah, you know, I learned a lot from Renee in terms of getting it done, but it is a, it is kind of a lean startup process. Cause you know, like a lot of times, you know, we're limited on our budget. So you got to try to do things as cheap and easy as possible. And, you know, the most important thing I could say in terms of um, the book and kind of the entrepreneurship side of it is like any business, you need to funnel your customers. So that's the most important thing in, in it, you know, in, in the publishing world, it's called a, a lead magnet, right? So like, let's say um, in, in like, uh, the c- consumer product world, a lead magnet might be a 15% off your purchase. If you sign up my, to my newsletter, right? You sign up to my newsletter and you're going to get a coupon for whatever percent off. That's a lead magnet to get people to drop their emails. So that way you can kind of keep blowing them up. Like, Hey, you know, like fall down your funnel. And in the self-publishing world, it's, you know, if you're going to write multiple books, it's making your first book free. So that way people can read it for free and then fall in love with you or not. And then, you know, you, funnel them down by charging them for follow-up books and for me like someone who's not going to write a ton of books that's why you know i am on my website you sign up for the newsletter and you get the introduction for free right so people sign up they on my newsletter they get the introduction for free and then they also get the newsletter and get to follow up you know get the insider info on on what i'm doing kind of in the background so yeah you know in a sense like because they're all funnels right we all got to funnel people to what we want them to see and we get to so it's just kind of the different aspects of the consumer product world, the business world, or the, the arts, the art side of the, the coin. So what's the goal of the book? Is the goal to like bring awareness to your army, to your whole life, to five, two, said, you know, I know, I know you're using to raise money for different organizations. What's the goal for the book? Um, the goal for the book is really, like you said, just to share the story, not so much my story. I, I mean, it is my story, but, um, I just wanted to share my story because it was so crazy, man. Like not knowing I was going to deploy until the day I left. I didn't know I was deploying until the day I left. I got my MRI results because I was hurt for four months. I got my MRI results the day before I left. And I didn't even know I was leaving until the day I left. I had like six hours to get ready. They're like, hey, you're deploying today. And I'm like, well, I need orders to take to my apartment because like I didn't even have deployment orders. I was like, hey, I can't just leave my apartment, guys. Come on, give me something. And so, uh, yeah, it was just this crazy experience. And uh and then when I got overseas, I have a, a chapter in my book called Handicap by Disarmament. So when I got overseas, they took my rifle away from me. And um, yeah, they basically disarmed me, right? Because here I am, a highly specialized trained sniper to use this weapon system. And one of the people in my company, obviously had to have been a very high up person, right? I was like, oh, sniper team has too much firepower. How about you give them your rifle? And uh, yeah, let's make our sniper team less effective. <laughs> And so, uh, yeah, man, it was just this crazy experience. And um, that's why I want to share my side of the story. But my side of the story is, you know, I only did about four or five months of the year long deployment, because like I said, I didn't know I was deploying to the day I left, like, I, then I got back and learned I should have never deployed to begin with because ortho never cleared me. And so, you know, it was, it was a wild ride for me. And it's like, my story is a wild ride. But all those guys who were there for the whole year, they're like there's the ones that need to tell their story so because many of them didn't get like the proper hearts or come entry badge a lot of them getting 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 what they did not receive what they deserve right yeah yeah well because of all the nonsense with the leadership and that those guys killing civilians you know it kind of made tainted the whole unit yeah so yeah and fortunately you know it's kind of shitty that you know maybe 30 people out of Thousands, for, yeah, thousands. I would say, you know, considering the brigade, probably 50 people out of 5,000. So what, 1%? 1% of them is going to, you know, ruin it for all of us. So, so yeah, man, uh, you know, that's kind of what drove me to tell the story. And it's like I said, if you go Google search Fifth Brigade, all you're going to find info on is the kill team or those idiots killing civilians and the bad leadership and what they did wrong or whatever. And it's, that's, that's part of the story. It's a very small part of the story, but the real story is these dudes who were doing such heroic, incredible things without, you know, metal detectors and without regard for their own safety. And so, uh, so yeah, like I said, man, I, 
hearing these guys' stories brought me to tears. I'm like, damn, like now we need it. I always wanted to make the documentary, but hearing their stories, I'm like, nah, the same way with my book before, like now, none of this documentary is going to get made because these guys need to share their stories because, yeah, man, like I, like I said, it's such a dream. And that's the big part of why, you know, it's funny because remember how I was talking to you while we were eating about, you know, doing this other podcast coming up and how that other host and and whatever. When I was talking to that guy, he's like, well, how come you didn't get it published by like a real publisher? Like, why are you self-publishing it? And I was like, well, because when you self-publish, you have all the control, right? You go with a publisher, they get creative control because you sign away the rights, right? You're going to get a small royalty. They do all the work, they what X, Y, Z. And so I told him, I was like, look, man, I didn't even bother shopping it around to book companies or whatever, because I don't want them to change the story, right? I want to tell the story of how it happened. And I don't want that to change. But I listened to Sacrifice by Michelle Black, and she talks about the really screwed up shit and the lies of the army that involved the cover up of what happened with all that stuff. And, and she's putting the truth out there, man. And it's a powerful, powerful book. And I'm like, wow, she talks about her investigations that she's doing and interviewing the people that were there and stuff like that. And I'm like, wow, like I was so worried that I wouldn't be able to share the story the way I wanted to share it, that I self published it. But when I was talking to this guy, he's like, no, nah, man, we can get you published. Like we're going to, you know, I'll connect you with these guys and they, you know, they're published authors. And uh, so, yeah, and like I said, I, you know, I was never really for it, but now that I, and it was funny because I told him, I was like, you know what, man, because I'm not pocketing any money from the book. Like, I don't care if a publisher picks me up because I'm not going to pocket any of it anyway. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know what, if I can get, agree to get a publisher to, you know, take 70, you know, take whatever huge percent they're going to take but then leave a huge percent to come back to these men to make the documentary, the audio book. And for me, you know, another reason I'm thinking about it more is because I do want to write more books now. Like I never thought so I'd you be- the, You got the writing book now? Yeah, I never thought I'd be a writer, man. But now there's for sure two more books I want to write, a fiction and a nonfiction. And the fiction book I will share, the nonfiction I won't, but the fiction book I want to write is, um, well, do I want to share this? Which of course you do <laughs> right now of course uh, you do <laughs> i don't know man do i want to share these now well i'll now i'll save the fiction i'll, I'll share the non-fiction right so the non-fiction book i want to write because it all goes back to that water quality stuff right and so i want to write a book that is in a, in a sense what what that seattle that english phd you know uw husky whenever i sent that email out kind of, kind of what she suggested at first I want to write a book talking about the water issue and the water we were drinking and how I think it was poison poisoning us and how I know it was poisoning us. And I also want to write it, like co-write it with someone who's been doing research or investigative journalistic type stuff in how plastic leaching into water makes us sick. So that way, the way I think I'm thinking about writing it is, you know, basically the problem you know, service members and people in general drinking contaminated water polluted with whether that be lead, you know, like in Flint or plastic, like with our example, and just like a prediction of this is the problem. This is what we can expect. And this is how we should try to mitigate the, you know, the, the problem in the future when it starts to rear its ugly head. Because like I said, you know, for my example, it'd be drinking the crap water that was overseas to what we can expect now that we know that these these things that leach from plastic mimic hormones and so we know that like hormones in our body you know aren't good right unless it's like properly dosed and done right by doctors so we're just drinking these hormonal cocktails and we don't know what's going to happen so yeah yeah so that's basically one of the books i want to write and then the other book the uh, fiction book i think i'll keep under wraps you have you have a like a schedule for this yet like when you start writing well, and all that kind of the stuff. schedule can definitely speed up if i get turned into a real published author mm -hmm. you know because at that point it's my job right like yeah i can promote this book but at the same time i can work on my other mm -hmm. books and i do definitely uh want to do it sooner rather than later um but yeah it all depends on life and, 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 and how everything goes and, and talk about how you're publicizing your current book what are you doing to help put the word out about that well, I'm doing these podcasts and, you know, I got the newsletter and, you know, Facebook groups and just promoting it on social media mostly. And, you know, I, I have been doing like public speaking gigs when I was in Texas. I did one in October. I was supposed to do one in uh, November, December, but 
I was going through so much stuff in December that when I went to Texas, I was just like, you know what, this is my vacation. Like, I'm just gonna enjoy my time. Are you able to like do any like publishing stuff, any publicity through the army related channels? I actually reached out and tried to see what the deal is with like a fees and getting on post, but they really just deal with published. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like and that's the, that's the downside of being a self published author. And that's one thing Renee Bob told me, she was like, you know, if you want to get your book in bookstores, you really just have to go to independently owned bookstores mm -hmm. because to get in Barnes and Noble and like these other yeah, be like, be okay. yeah, books and more is like one of the other books places. So yeah, to get into those places, you need to be like a, an actual published author that's going to get distribution by a major company kind of thing. So how many chapters are you in your book? Uh, 40 chapters, but they're all relatively, you know, quick chapters to read. Here's a question for you. Free. Someone says, Ricardo, man, I, I really want to read your book. I, you know, I want to learn about it. But I don't say I, I just have the time. What one chapter should I read? Ooh, um, probably one, what chapter should you read that might that want you to read more or you, what chapter should you, you, you read? You only, have, you only have time to read one chapter. Hmm. That one chapter kind of catch the edges of everything. <sighs> that's, a, that's a tough question. I think, and yeah, I have to say uh, the chapter called the reality check. Reality yeah, check. yeah. Just because uh, that was the, that was the first, you know, we were only, we had already been in Afghanistan for like a month. You know, we were on CAF, Kandahar Airfield, the big NATO base, safe and protected from all them, you know, all the amazing weapons of war we, we've created. But, and so, you know, we're there on CAF safe and, and you know, whatever, um, for a month prepping to go out to our FOB. And so once we got to the FOB and within, you know, the first couple of weeks, we, a lot of guys lost their lives. But probably within that first week of us being there, you know, was when we had that, when we took our first casualties, I almost lost my life that day. And it was kind of surreal to go out on mission, almost lose my life that day because we were in a major firefight and then come back from a very, you know, I was exhausted. It was a long day. And then to come back and um, learn that my, my brother in arms and the other 240 gunner when I was the 240 gunner. Uh, that he had lost his life, you know, that he was, that they, well, they didn't, weren't even sure what happened to him. You know, they, they thought he might've been kidnapped. They were pretty sure he was dead, but they thought he, they might've had his body drug off. And, um, but they weren't sure, you know, and, um, and at the time it was just weird. Like I said, you know, I, such a weird day, right? It's the first firefight I'd ever been in. And, um, it was crazy. And, um, and yeah, so then I got back and I was already so tired. And it was just, it was a crazy night because I was on my commander's vehicle. You know, I was one of, I was a sniper. So I'm his asset. I was on the commander's vehicle. And uh, when we were in Afghanistan, they told us they had like ropes, you know, on the vehicle and they wanted air guards to rope themselves to the vehicle because if the vehicle got blown up, they didn't want soldiers to get flung from the vehicle. I said, screw that. If we get blown up, I want to get flung from the vehicle. Right? I don't want some rope attached to me. Like, what if I get flung and it's going to like rip my body in half or you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I just want, I, I felt like I'd have better chances of living if I was going to get flung. And so, uh, man, my commander got mad at me. I was so tired. I mean, we had climbed mountains, mountains or giant hills all morning long and did that firefight all afternoon long. And so by the evening, it's just basically us snipers on the commander's vehicle and the commander. And my sniper buddies were asleep in the vehicle. It was a long day. And actually the uh, other lower sniper, not the sergeant, but the lower enlisted guy on the sniper team, he had been sick that whole day. He was throwing up all morning. Like it was a horrible day for us. And then I'm out there, like I'm on top of the vehicle. Like normally the air guard is supposed to be standing up, their body halfway out. I was just laying back, you know, knees up, you know, pulling security. Like I'm fucking... I don't know, gangster on this view, you know what I'm saying? Just like chilling, you know, I'm tired, just relaxing. Commander got after me and press, get back in the vehicle, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, we get back to the base and thankfully we're on the commander's vehicle because he is special enough to just get driven right up to the tents. And so uh, thankfully we didn't have to do all the extra down gear and drag our gear. So we were already tired. And then I get to the tent and on my bed, there's like somebody's crap, like, like literally head to toe, somebody's crap is just strewn all over my bed. And I was just like, I didn't care whose it was. It could have been them, the sergeant major of the brigades or whatever, you know, it's like, I just grabbed it and I dunked it. I was like, man, I'm so tired. I ain't going to deal with this right now. So I just dunked it. And then I just sat on the edge of the bed, man. And I was just like, 
decompressing, you know, thinking about all the shit that happened in that day, decompressing before trying to catch some Z's. And then one of the guys from my platoon comes up and he's like, Hey, you know, uh, you know, Tom's gone. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, we're pretty sure Tom's dead and like KIA. And the guy who told me, man, I couldn't believe it. You know, the source wasn't, but then he was like, well, yeah, the Sergeant so-and-so was the one who put the word out. And I'm like, oh, well now you're, now it's not just coming from you right now. You're saying a Sergeant said it. So I'm like, uh, I'm like, whatever, man, I'm too tired for this tonight. And then I woke up the next morning and, um, I looked over to that area of where that platoon, where he was in the guy who lost his life, Tom, I looked into that area of where he was in and the platoon was just huddled in a circle, you know, and you could just tell by the body language and just the, um, uh, the, the atmosphere of how everything felt that he was gone. And then, uh, I'll never forget, um, the platoon sergeant just yelling at the man, like, we got a fucking drop, you know, like, obviously, you know, everybody loved him and it's, you know, hurts, you know, when you lose guys like that. And so he was just doing his best to motivate his dudes. Like, yeah, we, somebody just died yesterday, but we got to go back out again. You know, like that's our job. And so, yeah, man, it was kind of like, for me, like I said, it was the reality check. Cause I almost died that day. And, and my good, my good friend did die that day. And then another soldier died that day too. So it wasn't just him, but and of course, from there, it just kind of got exponentially worse until they took us out of that area. And then that's when the casualties stopped when we got relieved. Yeah, that's some tough stuff, right? Yeah. So I was saying that's the, and then the, it's funny because that chapter is called the reality check. And the next chapter is called, can we check again? Question mark? Because <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it was a rough, a rough deployment. Yeah. Do you still keep in touch with people from 5-2? Um, I talk to one guy pretty regularly, mostly because he's been on this kind of crazy decade long, uh, self-destruction tour mm -hmm. since getting out, you know, he got blown up overseas. What, my platoon, right? My platoon, uh, one of another, one of our guys from our platoon died. So, you know, of course he basically died in his arms. You know, you try to help him, try to save him, you know, a very traumatic thing to, to experience. So, and it doesn't help as soon as he got blown up, the army took him away from us and started feeding him Ambien and opiates. And so, yeah, that was kind of the start of the, the slippery slide for him. You know, they isolated him. And I mean, he was partially to blame for that isolation because of the reason and how it happened. Um, but at the same time, like, yeah, he ended up isolating himself um, at WTB, which is like Warrior Transition Brigade on Fort Lewis. He got thrown into that instead of put back in our unit because a lot of the guys that got blown up overseas just got put on rear detachment for our unit. But he didn't because he had to go go above and beyond um, what a specialist should have to do to help a sergeant. And he helped a sergeant get out of Afghanistan that was being mentally tortured, basically. So that's why they shunned him away from us, because uh, at some point they realized, like, we can't let the soldier go back to his unit because they will mistreat him if we do so. So, yeah, I talked to him as much as I can. And really, really just him. And, you know, it kind of makes me sad because it. When I got out, I did keep in contact with quite a few guys because we all lived in this area still. And then when I moved back to Texas and started going to college, it's really when we started to, you know, not keep in contact as much. And it's kind of just been that way ever since, you know, the years go by pretty quick. And, you know, a lot of them still stayed in the military and did their thing. And, uh, or, you know, a lot of the guys that I served with uh, were stop lost, you know, kind of weird that they, you know, were technically didn't even have to deploy with their contractual obligation but army was like nope you're trained you're going and then uh yeah so they that was the what was kind of eye-opening to me like i said you know we're doing talking to a lot of these guys that i hadn't talked to in over 10 years from when we served overseas and making sure everything was good for my book and accurate and just uh being like man like god dang i haven't talked to you in forever you know and it's so weird but but it's kind of like those weird things i'm sure you know you know being a vet like you can go 10, 20 years without talking to some of these guys and you talk to them and just like, you never skip the yeah, day. Like, like you know, it's him, weird. Like you seen him yesterday. Yeah. It's really weird. It's a beautiful thing. So Ricardo, obviously you've seen a lot, been through a lot. Um, you're doing a lot now, your entrepreneurship, writing a book, research scientists. How do you take care of yourself? Um, that's funny. Cause I literally told them in the interview for my PhD program that I do a lot of soul searching. <laughs> And which is why I told you, I was like, man, when I had the th thought, like, even if I get into UW, like chances are, I'm probably going to have to do something in Texas because I just don't have the support here to let me properly attack this thing the way I want to. 
And so, yeah, man, I mean, get outdoors. I love going fishing, trying to catch the salmon, hearing the rivers run in the creeks. That's why I love this place. Uh, I love going gold panning, going looking for gold in the rivers and just getting outdoors. And, um, and that there's also, I also like to just have quiet time. You know, I like a lot of times on this commute, or I can't say a lot, but you know, I'd say multiple times a month, I just drive home with no music on. I just lost in my thought. You, you know, know people so, don't realize the importance of that, right? Everyone says, you know, listen to podcasts, listen to music, do whatever. But I think it's so important, at least 30 minutes, uh, at least once a week, 30 minutes, just go and just like zone out, right? Just nothing in your brain. If you amazed how many ideas and stuff pop up out of nowhere, you would never think about because you have like total blank space. Yeah. And I think that's why it, the way people act these days, whether that be on social media or in person, like it's people don't do that anymore. You know, we have, because growing up, you know, I grew up on a ranch, like I said, with three channels, mostly static you know, video games that were 8-bit, not the most fun, not the most deep, you know, it's like I grew up with just shooting guns and wandering my ranch with my own thoughts as a kid. And so, man, like it hurt because I, I was a young kid and I'd see these adults doing things and I'm always wondering like, what? Why are they doing this? That can't be right. Like, why are they doing these things, you know? And, and yeah, for a long time, like my sister and I were the adults and our parents were the kids, you know, like they're always bickering and fighting and acting weird. Like, no, you don't do that. You don't act like that. And so, yeah, it's just these days, there's so many distractions of social media, everything at the click, you know, instant of, you know, so nobody really wants, I can't say they don't want to, but they don't proactively try to get themselves to. And I think a lot of people are afraid, you know, because it's like my some of my buddies that are dealing with, you know, alcohol abuse or whatever, I talk to them about using weed or cannabis and edibles, you know, as a, as a way to kind of battle your demons, you know? And so they always tell me like, no, nah, man, I can't do that. I get so paranoid or I start to like freak out, you know, like I, I start to think, you know, about the things I did in the past and it bothers me. I'm like, well, you know, that's kind of part of Like you got to think about those things and, reflect on you gotta, them yeah it. You like you gotta, gotta confront it yeah you gotta battle your demons you know like it's uh it's an important part of growing as a human being you know you gotta understand um you reflect on the times when you felt like you were right and ultimately were wrong and kind of remember you know like damn it's you know it's weird because a lot of times i meet people and i have to i push back because a lot of times people say such blanket statements you know it's always just like you know, they'll say something. I'm like, Oh, like that's a super blanket statement. Like you just can't, you know, and I, it's kind of weird because, you know, I'm always trying to be cautious about that. Cause I know I do say things, but I always try to be, you know, when I, once I catch myself, I'm like, well, you know, it's kind of a blanket statement, but you know, X, Y, Z. So, uh, yeah, it's just, like I said, I think it's the quiet time. And for me, that's really what got me out of my depression and it's all mental, you know, it's super cliche to say, you know, but it's all in our head. You know, we have the the power to change our mindset and get done what we, you know, do what we yeah. need to do or get. What and most depression comes from stuff to have no past. Right. And like, isn't it, isn't you would think it's in the past. It can affect you, but it affects so many people because they, they can't get over it for whatever reason. Yeah. And, and the most powerful example I can give of that is my depression that I pulled myself out of in, in 2017. And it was more, de I was more depressed than when I was in the army. That's kind of crazy to say, but for me, it was like, life is not going the way I want it to go. And now I have kids in the army. I didn't have kids and life sucked, but at least I didn't have kids to drag through the suck with me, you know? And so I had got to a point in my life, five years of military service, five years of college to where I felt like man, I should be able to provide for my family now with a good job. And so uh, when that didn't happen, I couldn't get a job and I got depressed because I was kind of, you know, a decade of grinding my ass off military and school. And now I'm kind of sitting at home, taking care of kids in these four walls and man, I cherished it. You know, I'd rather have my kids with me than anybody else and raising them at those, you know, critical stages, but it drove me crazy. And then, uh, it literally my oldest daughter got into kinder, got pneumonia around, you know, the fall. And, uh, I mean, I was so depressed. I was such a shitty person, man. Like I was like, I was a dark cloud following me everywhere. And, um, 
I was always yelling and depressed and like angry, you know, and I would yell at my kids like they were soldiers, you know, like they were babies and I'm yelling at them like they're soldiers, you know, and I know that happens a lot in the military realm, you know, and it seems like it's an acceptable thing to do, but, but, and especially for me, man, cause I can yell, like I a lot of times I could yell louder than most of those sergeants that I served with. So I can, I got some pipes on me, man. I can yell pretty loud. And, um, and so when my daughter got sick, and my wife had always been telling me, you know, you're, you're shitty. You're always you're like, you know, obviously you're, you're being shitty. You're always depressed. You're always mad. And I knew it, but like, what can I do? And I, I got nothing, but uh, my daughter got sick, super sick on the brink of hospitalization. And um, that night, man, I was just in my garage um, enjoying my vape pen, you know, just enjoying a, a little bit of vape and thinking about how shitty I am. And then thinking about how, my current state is detrimental to my daughter's current state, right? Like me being shitty is not going to help her get better. I'm not going to help her feel better. And the way I was thinking about it was like, I just need to fake it till she gets better. Like I didn't have any long-term goals or like, yeah, I'm going to do all this mental health hoopla to get better or whatever. I was just like in the moment thinking really deep about how I just need to fake it, right? Just fake put a smile on my face, be cheery, uh, pretend like just force it out of myself. And for two weeks, right? Two, three weeks, maybe a month till she completely recovers. And then when that happens, I can just go back to being shitty. Right? I mean, that's kind of my kind of shitty mindset. But the crazy thing about it was like, while I was thinking these thoughts in my garage, the, I could feel the world around me changing. It was the craziest thing I could and like I said, I didn't have any like grand scheme of like, oh, I'm going to do this forever. It was just like, yo, I'm going to do this for now until my daughter gets better. And then we'll take it from there. You know, like maybe I'll be better. Maybe I'll be less depressed or whatever. But the craziest thing was just thinking those thoughts and literally feeling like the world was changing around me. And then within like a week, right? So I did that, walked out of that garage, like, you know, freaking set in my ways of I'm going to do this, uh, you know, and for a couple of weeks or however long it takes her to get better. And then I, I'm pretty sure it was like two days later, maybe even the day after the Seattle times emailed me with that opportunity. Oh, okay. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. And so I was just like, Whoa, like, is this the start? Like the world was changing around me and the universe. Cause I had emailed the Seattle times the year before I had seen that ad the year before. Um, that's your first speaking thing. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I had seen the ad the year before to do that, to, to do the speaking gig. And they didn't pick me. So I was like, oh, I never thought I'd going to hear back from them again. And then they, a year later, it was almost like the universe knew that I needed that little pick me up to help me push myself forward. I got a random email from the Seattle Times saying like, hey, we still have your submission from last year. We like it. Are you still interested in doing it? Oh yeah, I got something to work towards now, right? And I got five weeks of preparing for a public speaking gig. And so, yeah, it's a kind of like, it, it worked out because like I had those thoughts. I felt the universe changing around me and then a couple of days later i had that opportunity and now i had five weeks to focus and work on something and that's what pulled me from the depression too right because now i had something to focus on but when i got was getting ready to give the talk and get done i was like dang like once so, there's not going to be another magical email that comes right there's not going to be another like hey come give a talk come do this like so i was like man i need to do something because if not i'm going to go back into my depressed state and i don't want that so I just started doing automotive work and picked up sewing and you know, I know how to do a little bit of sewing and stuff now. And, uh, but, you know, did redid everything on my minivan from the brake system all the way, you know, from suspension, lower control arms, you know, shock struts, exhaust, everything, man. I, I completely redid that van and even went on to the cosmetics, redid the headliner, like just keeping my hands and my mind busy. Cause I know that if, if I, if I choose to wallow in my shit. I'm going to be depressed. Like if I choose to not use my hands, like, like they say, idle hands are the devil's, you know, whatever, right? Like you've got idle hands, man, you're going to be depressed. We're human beings. We need to, we need to, whether Maybe that's some kind of purpose or something. Yeah. Like, yeah. And it is, like I said, a reason to wake up. So yeah. To speak. It doesn't even have to be glorious, like mechanic work and sewing, you know, and that's what got me by. And then I was like, you know what, with all the other stuff that happening, that's when I started writing my book and it was just like a momentum builder. And that's why when I stopped writing the book, I was like, man, now I got nothing, but I don't want to have nothing. I need to follow this patent, right? I just need to create more momentum to keep me going. Have you thought about doing a TEDx talk to help 
push out your book yeah oh uh, well i mean i did um uh, i did apply to to the last tedx seattle event mm -hmm. and they rejected me so i mean i have tried so you know, so we were talking about Matt Rama earlier, right? Yeah, yeah. So right, Matt Rama, I could be wrong, but one of his good friends is has some kind of connection with TEDx. Oh, nice. Not TEDx Seattle, but the one north of here, I think. I'm not sure. But get, get oh, with okay. Matt. He has, one of his friends is somehow, somehow connected with TEDx. Nice. I remember Matt doing some kind of photography for a TEDx event that his friend put together or something, right? Yeah, and I don't, you know, I don't blame them for not, you know, liking my talk. And I actually, I, when I submitted, I was not expecting them to literally want your talk in the submission mm -hmm. you know i thought like you'd give them a like because it's kind of like what i did with the seattle times i gave them a two minute long phone call pitch or like a real quick hey my teacher saved me i was going to drop out plants the end you know what i'm saying so when i did the tedx application um working through it they're like okay now attach your talk and i'm like oh shit i haven't even like i know what i want to talk about but i haven't literally like planned it out because yeah, no, I, I, I thought tedx helped you put you talk together well yeah that's what i thought too you know because that's basically what it was with the seattle times like i did have that generic generic idea and then i went to coaching meetings and you do get a little bit of coaching you know and i know they do that and so that's kind of what i was expecting so when i applied and they were like yo submit your talk i'm just like oh went crazy for 30 minutes you know and kind of just spat it out because that you know at that point we're getting closer to the deadline i was like man i just need to get this done it's not what i was expecting i need to get it done and the talk was just about the power of networks you know like i never realized the power of a network until i went to business school and like man business school really opens your eyes to the, how important it is to network and that's why i got the job i have now like i had all the qualifications before to be a scientist but i couldn't get the job of the scientist until i networked and you know went and did all the stuff I did at UW. And so as basically was uh, the gist of my talk was just talking about how, you know, importance of networks and stuff like that. But the next talk I'd like to submit is a little teaser. It's because now I feel in my life that we all live multiple lifetimes. So you do. You're yeah. Right. Yeah. So the way I think about it is, you know, there is no guarantee we're going to be die at 80 years old or whatever the case is. So the way I think about it is basically 18 years, 18 years is a lifetime, right? Like you, you know, you have your first 18 years of life, you graduate high school, <clears throat> excuse me. And then now I just turned 36, right? So that's another 18 years. So it's like my first lifetime, it was hard, right? I had to deal with a lot of my environmental nonsense. And then my second 18, my second lifetime, and it, I almost, you know, my senior year in high school, I had a gun to my head. I felt worthless. I, I felt like I had zero, you know, like there was nothing I could ever accomplish or do. I just felt complete, you know, like I was just wasting people's air. And, and so like that first 18 years, I didn't think I could do in that, in that first lifetime. I didn't think I could do the things that I'm doing in the second lifetime. And now I just got done with my second lifetime, right? I became a sniper. I made a childhood dream cap happen. I got my degrees, something I like never thought I could do, like in engineering and chemistry. And, um, and then, yeah, and then wrote a book and filed a patent and went to business school and like became a scientist ultimately before my 36th birthday. And so I'm like, damn, now I have, you know, these two lifetimes are the things that I've done. Now I have another third lifetime I'm pushing into, right? With my entrepreneurial stuff, my book, my patent the other things I hope to do in the future. And so I was like, dang, you know, like, I hope to get another 18 years out of this body and, and hopefully have another lifetime of things I can kind of make happen. And who knows, man, because my, ultimately my goal is to end up in space, you know, like whether that's me paying for it or NASA sending me up, like my so goal. If Elon Musk says, Ricardo, you be the first one to Mars, you're like, you're like, ding, Ooh, ding, ding. That's a, that's a tough one. You know, if there's a plan to try to come back, you know, I'd be more for it than a one-way trip. But <laughs> But yeah, man, that's still tempting. My wife might not like hearing that, but yeah, <laughs> it's still, probably not. It's still I actually signed up to be, a, I don't know, I'd butcher his name. He's a Japanese entrepreneur and he literally like bought out all this, this uh, seats for one of the SpaceX flights, like for the first one that's going to go past the moon and come back. And he just had a competition where he opened it up to the world. Like, yo, you want to go to space on my flight? I got 12 seats because he's like, he bought, I think it's like 20 seats. And he's taking like eight guests or something, right? So it's like him, a couple of his guests, and he had the rest of those seats. He opened it up to applications of people around the world. 
And so I applied, you know, I was like, man, send me to space. You know, it's like whether I'm paying for it or NASA is sending me, you know, I'm going to go. And so, yeah, I hope in this next 18 years, man, whether that be whenever I'm about to turn 60 or, or whatever, you know, <laughs> like yeah. getting, getting up there. But yeah, you know, it's, um, it's funny because my wife always, you know, I laugh and joke with her about all the different things I'd like to do in my lifetime. And, uh, and it's funny because she was looking at, oh, what's his name? It's one of the mo- recent astronauts. I can't remember. His name. Um, anyways, but if you go to his Wikipedia page, it'll be like scientist, engineer, astronaut, singer, songwriter. <laughs> and I'm like, my wife started laughing about that. I was like, yes, yeah, so that's going to be me. It's going to be like sniper, scientist, engineer, uh, astronaut, you know, rapper, you know what I'm saying? Like whatever, you know, just going crazy. Um, Oh, actually, I also want to get into endurance racing, endurance, uh, endurance racer. <laughs> I was like, so yeah, um, who knows what's going to happen in the yeah. next 18 years. But that, that's basically what I want my next submission TEDx talk to be about. Because, you know, our lifetimes, man, like, and who's to say that my next lifetime is going to be good? You know, this next 18 years, you know, God forbid my, my kids, you know, I, I could have one of my kids lose their lives. You know what I'm saying? Like, but you never know yeah, what's gonna happen. yeah, life life is going to shit on us. And what I always tell people, what I've learned is um, it's important to not get too high when things are going good, right? Like, yeah, life's going good. Things are trending your way. And it's, I'm not saying like you shouldn't celebrate yourself or relish in your accomplishments, but you also need to remember like life isn't good all the time forever. You know, at some point life's going to shit on you. And when life shits on you, it's important to not get too low, right? You can't get too high and you can't get too low. And I'm not saying don't be depressed. Don't wallow in your shit, but try to minimize it, right? Like, you know, obviously you lose a loved one, something traumatic happens. I'm not saying you can't, don't have the right to be depressed for three to six months. But at some point you need to start pulling yourself back up. You know, you can't get too low, man, because it's too easy to stay down there. You know, have have you seen this talk? It was Tom Hanks. There's a bunch of other actors. It's kind of round table, just about acting, stuff like that. And talk about how like sometimes, you know, as an actor, whatever, like people shit on, right? Talking they're horrible, whatever and how they get depression, bad stuff. And, and Tom Hanks like, you gotta remember this is gonna pass, you know, right? This time will cure all wounds, it's gonna pass. However, comma, when everyone says you're the best thing ever, this too shall pass, you yeah, know? Yeah, no doubt, because, um, you know, no matter what heights we reach, man, we're all the flavor of the minute, you know? Like, you know, you might be the champion of the world, the fastest Olympic runner or something, but man, father time comes for us all. And, you know, eventually you get relegated to the history yeah. books and there's nothing wrong with being in the history book, man, but you know, you can't expect, you know, to be at the top forever, you know, and that's uh, part of, you know, what I, you know, my, and I, I think that goes back to the patience thing too, you know, it's like you, things are going well and you when, when they don't, you get impatient because you're like, man, when things go well, time goes fast, right? When you're having a good time, time goes fast. And so, yeah, I think that plays a lot into the patience thing is because when things aren't going well, man, time just feels like it's, you know what I'm saying? Like, you just feel like you're stuck, you know, like day to day, you're just stuck. And, um, and it's hard to be patient. And when, especially whenever you're trying to work out of that depression and you're not getting the results you expect right away, it's like, you know, it's a big part of the patience and, and yeah. making sure you're not too high or low because yeah. things don't happen that fast. So if you put yourself too low and make your expectations too high, you're going to put yourself even lower because you're gonna be like, I'm doing all this work and it's not working. And it's like what I always tell my, my army buddy, I always tell him, you've been on a decade long train wreck. You're going to need more than a year to get back on track. And you know what I'm saying? Like you can't, destroy your life for 10 years and think in one month you're going to get things back going no i mean you can start to and you can start trending things in the right way but it's a multi-year long process to recover the person you were before everything you went through so here's here's a funny story so i was in the bay area for a visit right and um i I caught the it's called the bart i was the bart first time and so i'm in the bart and this guy walks in the middle of the train right this guy, he's like, he's caked in dirt. He has on a sleeping bag. I have no idea if his clothes on besides a sleeping bag. He's like dirt everywhere, just looking nasty. He's saying, can someone give me a dollar? I'm telling myself, dude, 
you need more than a dollar. <laughs> like, dude, you need someone to invest in your life to make your life better, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, what, what is a dollar going to do for you, right? Like, yeah, nothing, exactly. right? If someone needs us, take your side. Hey, guy, I'm going to volunteer you in my life to make you better, right? Mm -hmm. And even then, we probably won't be enough, right? Yeah. It's funny because um, I went to Dick's Burgers for the, I've never had a Dick's Burger. Me neither. I've never had a Dick's really? Burger. You know, I've oh never had a Dick's Burger. Oh, my God, dude. I just had one this past week. Never had one. I never had one. And I'm like, now that I'm, possibly getting ready to leave i'm like man i need to look at other food spots around where i work you know maybe a five to ten minute drive so i can just get a little bit more you know cultured in in the different cuisines of, around here and so i saw dick's burgers i was like oh damn i never knew a dick's burgers was right here in east lake area like by where i work so i went and then i'm standing in line and a homeless guy comes up like you know he's asking talking people you know whatever and I'm, and i was just talking to my army buddy like i said i talked to him almost every day so i had just hung up with them and I think he saw that I was in a good mood. And he think, I think he saw that I was happy. He was, I was in a good mood, man. Like things, you know, especially with that interview and the way things are going over these last two weeks, I'm, you know, I've been in a pretty good mood overall. And so he came up and he was like, hey, you know, because uh, I think it was yesterday they did 19 cent burger day. So you could have gone to Dick's and got a burger for 19 cents. So the, it was the day before that. So the homeless guy was like, oh, man, I thought it was, you know, 19 cent burger day. You know, do you mind buying me a burger? You know, I'm hungry and you know, whatever. I was like, yeah, man, I got you. I got you, you know, whatever. I was just, you know, because I, I was hungry. Like I tell you, I only eat once a day. So when that hunger hit, like, man, like I need something, you know? And so I felt really hungry and, and I just, I didn't want that guy to go to sleep hungry. You know what I'm saying? Like he's a human being, you know, he's, you know, people, these other people might not look at him like that, but I'm like, nah, man, you're not going hungry tonight. I'm here, you know? So I was like, um, cause there, so there's like the Dick's Deluxe. And then that's like the most expensive burger they have. And then there's a, the, just the normal dicks or something. And I was like, what do you want a dicks? Cause in my mind, I don't, you know, I've never been there before. I don't know anything on the menu. And he's like, oh, can I get a dicks deluxe? And I was like, you know what, man? Yeah, I'll get you a dicks deluxe. And that ended up, the deluxe has two meats in it. The regular just has one. And uh, so I got the burgers and I gave it to him and uh, I gave him, he's like, oh, thank you. Thank you. I was like, oh, no, man, like take care of yourself tonight. Like, man, just, you know, be safe, take care of yourself. And he's like, and he tells me, uh, it makes it a lot easier with people like you, man. Like, yeah, it's easier to take care of myself, you know, when there's people like you to, you know, lend a helping hand. I'm like, Shh, that's all it's about. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I'm sure a lot of those people around me make more than my little measly RS1 salary, <laughs> you know, like, man. I, and like I said, man, for me, it was just like having that hunger. And because when, like, as, you know, earlier when we were eating, I was like, man, I need to eat. Like, I eat once a day. I, I, this is the point where I need to eat. And so, like, just feeling that hunger and, yeah, we, I couldn't that's imagine. A good call. That's a good call. We ate earlier because I knew it was just gonna be a kind of long talk. So yeah, yeah I can imagine if we didn't eat, eat, eat earlier. Yeah, yeah, my stomach would be flipping right now. <laughs> but, but yeah, man, it's just like those things. You know, it's we all we all get you know we all have the capacity to be evil or good. We all have the capacity to be you know up or or uh, in a better position, and we all have the ability. You know, like that's one thing in the recession taught a lot of people. I think in two thousand eight was. You know, you might have all these nice things, but, uh, you know, at, you know, at the, the whim of Vladimir, Vladimir <laughs> Putin over, you know what I'm saying? Like the yeah. whims of these people, man, you, you're, you world. never know how something else thousands of miles away is going to affect you. Yeah, not affect yeah. you. So it's kind of these things like, yeah, man, I've, I've experienced life enough on both sides. And it's funny. Cause I always have people come tell me like, man, you're so humble. You're so cool. And like, I'm just me, man. I, just cause I got my degrees, just cause I served in the military that doesn't define it. And that's one thing about me is I've always tried to stay true to who I am. And that's why I like spending time with myself with quiet, you know, because it really, I think, feel like that's what keeps me grounded. You know, it's like, I'm thinking about not only what I want to make happen, but situations that are currently happening and how I handle those situations and how I could get better at them. And, you know, it's a, it's a lot of work. Yeah, one thing I think when I realized the human race, like I was thinking we realized that how much experimentation we've done as human race, right? Like imagine like how many people had to die from eating poison mushrooms <laughs> yeah, exactly. before they say we should eat this no more. <laughs> or like, you know, how many people, you know, like walked out into the into the ocean mm -hmm. and died, you know, maybe while 20 people walked out there, maybe we should not, you know, like the, the, the amount of experimentation to get the fact we are, and even that's like the immune system, right? Like how many people die from diseases back in the day that mm -hmm. we don't even think of, right? Just a constant experimentation of the human race, right? I don't think people will get that. Yeah, you know, and, and that's a big part of this journey of eating once a day is now that I eat once a day, I know what's going in my body and I know how it's reacting with my body. 
So it's kind of crazy for me to eat something and know like, man, now yeah, I'm because the human body, we're not meant to eat like 10, 12 times a day. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, actually, I think it was, um, oh, I can't remember his name, but, uh, there's like a, a TV journalist or whatever. He comes out on, um, on like the news stations, he talks about keeping a food journal. And I was like, man, this is a powerful thing. I wish, you know, I'm definitely going to do this one of these days. You know, obviously I, my kids need to be a bit older and I need to be able to have more structure in my life to do this. But he says, what you should do is you should eat something, write it down. And then like two hours later, write down how it makes you feel. And you do that enough and you're going to find your superfoods. You're going to find the things that make you feel like energized and you know happy and, he, and it's really funny because he talks about how whenever he needs to come up with something novel like new ideas for maybe a new book or you know whatever he eats pickles because he knows if he eats pickles that kind of spurs the the novel imaginative kind of juices in his brain and he goes on to other examples of it and i'm like dang how kind of you know imagine the power of that being uh a musician or a music, you know, a music, you know, producer or an artist or something and be like, yo, I need to get these creative juices flowing. Let me eat, you know, a mango or, you know what I'm saying? And it's in to get that extra boost rather than, you know what, I, I'm feeling creative. Let me go get a subway. You know, I'm hungry and I want to do art. Let me go get a subway, you know? And ultimately that's going to be a de more detriment than a help kind of thing. Yeah. So. Even better what foods not to eat. Like me, I love, I love Mexican food, right? If I be Mexican food, I'm probably not going to be productive another two, three hours, right? <laughs> yeah, man. Well, that's those things is, um, you know, I kind of started this early on. Um, it's easier to do you know, now that I work because I'm away from home a lot. But I started this at home for a small stint, maybe like three to six months. And people say, oh, you're going keto. I, I think that's what they refer to it. I was like, no, nah, I mean, I guess. But then I, I drink like a soda a day. I eat hard candy. So it's like I'm trying to minimize like chewing food and digesting food like i will still take in sweets so people are like oh that's not cute because you just your system needs a break once in a while yeah yeah yeah. and so um but man i'll never forget my first time doing this like even i think it was before even i got into my graduate program at you know business school i would I started eating clean for a few weeks and then like i would eventually fall you know occasionally fall off the horse and eat a giant slice of pizza or like very carb heavy stuff man that it will put you down. Like it'll drag you down it and does. put you to sleep. It does. And I couldn't believe it. I'm like, whoa, like this is really weird. Like it tastes good, but now I'm like, can't do nothing for two hours. You know, like, man, it's crazy. One thing I want to try, I want to try this carnivore diet that people are talking about. We eat nothing but meat. I want to try it. I, I think try we that. talked about that a little bit. That's yeah. literally how I, I lived before I, my I, wife. I want to try that. I want to try the carn carnivore diet, like eat a steak every meal or something yeah, like that's man, so crazy that's, i did literally i mean i probably had like some green beans and a little bit of other stuff on the side but you know night for, for sure dinner and of course you're in the army you're going to the defect you're getting your other little bit of food but for sure dinner man i was just having steaks uh, i was like yo i can afford to just have steaks for dinner why not you know so and my wife when my wife first moved in with me she was just like where's your microwave I was like, micro, why do I need a microwave? <laughs> I'm like, I just cook steaks, you know, like I ain't reheating anything. I'm just cooking fresh steaks and I'm never home, right? I'm at work all day. And when I'm here at dinner, it's steak time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, that's, uh, and I was a lean, mean fighting machine, man. I was in, in great shape. That's what got me ready for the sniper team was my, my carnivore. I don't know, it wasn't strictly carnivore, but, and then my wife came and added all the sugars and sweets <laughs> and carbs and other stuff. And, and then my start, my platoon sergeants were like, Perez, you putting on some weight? <laughs> like, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So we talked about uh, edibles earlier. One thing that's like kind of crazy, of course, in the military, there's drug tests. And, and of course, you, you get only people in the military like, hopped up on drugs, marijuana mm -hmm. case would be. But like, I'm not saying every veteran I know has is on drugs. I'm, say, I'm not saying every veteran does drugs, but every veteran I know has either done edibles, marijuana, maximum muscle, LSD. Yeah, they've yeah, done. Yeah some kind of drug just kind of crazy how like go from like no drugs at all like it's like they're almost like a rebellion thing right yeah and i think there's a lot of benefits to some of these drugs right and that it's been proven through data stats this stories you mm -hmm. know people say i've been depressed they take some edibles they're happy whatever same thing with the massive restrooms the yeah. micro dosing it's just and it's crazy I, like only like you, you you're watching you do it you fly to texas i mean people still doing texas of course mm -hmm. but you're not gonna do be do so public about yeah, it yeah you know? it's really 
unfortunate you know it's kind of stupid to you to have to like how marijuana is a class one drug i mean i'll never understand yeah it's you know propaganda nonsense that you know it's political nonsense is what it boils down to you know other interests and lobbies of yeah. you know actual you know trees and cotton and you know what i'm saying like business interests and that's kind of like the and it's funny because before i went to business school i kind of always had that underlying um I guess feeling is not really the right word, but like that underlying kind of conditioning of business people are shitty, you know, like businessmen, you know, being in business, you got to be shitty and backstabby or whatever, but it's really quite the opposite. Like most businesses and business owners want the best for their business and their customers, yeah. right? Cause if they didn't, we wouldn't have all the remarkable things that we yeah. have now, you know? So not, you know, like I said, there's always those bad actors and those shit bags, no matter how many gates you put in place. But for the most part, man, business owners and these corporations, you know, obviously a corporation gets so big and, you know, the, it's hard to rein in and control something that's the size of Amazon, right? So, um, you know, at, at some point the company grows, it gets harder to manage. But these early stage startups and at the end of the day, you know, they, they you know, it's when they go public that they get in trouble because then they got shareholders that they, yeah. you know, got to kind of, at the end of the day, make more rich. So, so Ricardo, is there anything else to ask you that I didn't know? Anything else you want to talk about? Um, no, just other than, you know, the books available online on Amazon. Uh, the ebook is for pre order right now, and the paperback book is available now. The, the crazy thing with the paperback, right? So, I, I got the email that it was approved. I went to order like um, author copies of the book, right? Like copies for the printed price, author copies of the book. So I order eight copies and they're telling me like, oh, you'll get them mid April or like, you know, like two weeks in April. I told my buddy from high school, the book's out. He goes and buys it at the full price and he's supposed to be getting it today. I don't know if he got it today or not, but I just thought that was weird. Like, dude, I ordered eight copies and who cares if I paid the author's price for them? Like I should get them faster than you know what i'm saying so yeah you think yeah 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 so regardless weird stuff but books available now paperback i'm working on getting quotes for the hardcover version so yeah uh, so what kind of coaching you guys have you some fuck famous people just regular people or just people who yeah, read man. your book or? i don't yeah just whoever whoever you know that's kind of i was going to add that to my linkedin post i was gonna be like anybody with clout but i was like ah it's such a cringy yeah like linkedin's cringy enough like i'm not yeah. gonna you know so um yeah, so that's why I just posted it like that. And like, I really don't care, man. I mean, it'd be cool to have like a Medal of Honor recipient mm -hmm. or a politician or I actually was tr wanting to try to get uh, a neuroscientist to, you know, like, I'd actually like to get my brain scanned and see if there's <laughs> something different about my crazy brain. And, you know, because I feel like the things that I've experienced have really formed and changed mm -hmm. my brain and its chemistry. So I'd like to, you know, that's a kind of a tangent. But, but yeah, man, like I said, I'm athletes author, other authors like you know i just please like i said i'm just playing the percentages i need as many people as i can clout or not you know whatever to look and plus you need amazon reviews amazon's big on reviews so you need yeah amazon reviews, yeah right? so right now you know it's all available online and i'll probably make the ebook available sooner than april 20th which is it's technical it's on pre-order now uh, especially if my buddy gets his book today, it's kind of no point in having the ebook unavailable when people are receiving yeah. the physical copy. So I'm going to message him after this and see if he did get it today. And regardless, that ebook is for pre order. It'll, you know, whenever it's on there for $5.99 or $4.99 now, when I release it, it'll be 99 cents. So, you know, pick it up. I'm not going to make a lot of money off it, but any money that does get made off it, it goes back to, you know, these other things and these other lifting the voices, getting the documentary done. So, yeah, just uh, get the book, learn the story, and uh, don't Google search for the day. That's a waste of time. Read yeah. my book. So I was going to ask you, why the title Born to Fail? Oh, <laughs> um, it's kind of funny. You know, uh, I always knew that I wanted fail. Well, actually, what was the original title of the book? I can't even remember at this point. I remember from what I wanted to call it in uh, Afghanistan, which is not PC. And, you know, definitely don't want to go there with it. But... Um, you know, I was a disgruntled soldier, just angry at the world. So I wanted to make it an ugly book title. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, and then something, I can't remember what I wanted to call it, but all I knew, no, is I wanted it to have something with fail or failure. So I was like, man, uh, I don't know what I wanted to 
be titled, but I just wanted to have fail or failure. And so I'm like running all these different things in my head. And then I read David Goggins book. And at the, at the end of one of his first chapters, he mentions we are all born to fail. And I was like, boom, there it is. Right. Like I was wanting failure in the title and he literally wrote my, named my book for me born to fail. Cause we're all born to fail. And so I was like, dang, like, and then of course you have to put the positive twist around it, embrace yeah. hardship to, you know, cause you don't want just a negative. And that's another thing about if I do get picked up by a, a big time publisher, they're probably going to want to change the title of the book because the convention of writing books is you never make your title negative, right? Failure is a negative word. Born to fail is a negative connotation. So there's a chance, in, but, but that's why I put the positive twist on it too. You know, embrace hardship to forge your warrior spirit. Um, because like I said, it's not, you know, failure is essential to everybody. We grow, we learn and uh, yeah. we get better. So that's what I'm saying. Just, I, I think someone said it. It's better, better to fail 10 times, succeed once than to succeed three times with no failure or something, something like that. Yeah, yeah. And then it's kind of funny because another example of this is another startup company that creates jerky products has animals. Like, so if they have beef jerky, they got a little picture of a cow on the jerky package. And if it's like chicken jerky or whatever. And, um, and whenever they started the company, they were getting feedback like, no, you don't want to put the animals pictures on the packages like consumers aren't going to like that, you know, blah, blah. And they're like, no, nah, we feel like it's fine. Like we don't, you know, people you're eating beef, you know, it's a cow or like just because there's a picture or not. So they ended up just doing what they felt was right and ended up being a super successful company. And they're like, yeah, people were trying to get us early on to change our labels and our logos and our name because they felt like it was going to push customers away. But, and it's funny because I did a, Scribe Media, which is what did who did David Goggins memoir, I did their masterclass on memoir. And it was uh, through that self publishing subreddit, right? Somebody on that self publishing subreddit said, Hey, guys, uh, masterclass, you know, like, like the masterclass website mm -hmm. is hiring scribe to do a masterclass on writing memoirs. So we're going to record this event. If you'd like to join it, you can join it for free. So I literally got a masterclass on memoir writing by scribe media who does memoirs for all these famous celebrities and people and they literally said in that class you don't want your memoir to be, have a negative title okay and so i was just like man i'm gonna name it born to fail anyway <laughs> like i don't care what you say because i feel like this is what it should be named you know like so that's where i came up with the title you know thank you david goggins i know you probably never see this but <laughs> yeah yeah so ricardo can you share your social media so people can reach out to you yeah um you can look me up on Amazon. Now I just created my Amazon author page, amazon.com slash author slash Ricardo P. Perez. Uh, my website, you can sign up on my newsletter and get a uh, full transparency of how the money is being spent every quarter of the year. I'm going to send out an expense revenue report of how the money's, you know, what money coming in, money's coming in and how it's getting spent. So sign up for my newsletter, Ricardo P. Perez.com. Um, social media, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, just type Ricardo Perez, uh, you probably find my actual page or my author page. Um, Twitter is at the real Kemja. It's kind of a mix of chemistry and ninja. I'm, a, I'm the chemical ninja. So I'm the Kemja. So yeah, Twitter at the real Kemja and Instagram. I'm pretty sure it's just my name, Ricardo Perez. So yeah, I don't use much of any of it at all, but Hey, it's there. And to listen, we have the links to all the social media on the show notes. You find the show notes at www.cavinshrblog.com. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to Jason Cavins Experience on your favorite podcast platform. So, Ricardo, any last minute advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Um, no, nah, man, I think, I think this is good for now, man. I appreciate your time as always. I uh, love what you do. I love that you give people this platform. And, and I love that you're pushing your stuff forward now, man. It's, yeah. uh, you know... You, you're getting to, into your later lifetimes and now it uh, should be all about you now, man. So yes. I'm really happy and I'm always here to support you. So no matter what I, I can I do. Need you, I need for you to tell my wife and kids that, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's all about me. It's all about me now. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so listeners, thank you for your time and remember to be great every day. Bye everyone. <laughs>